Did you ever think you would make it? I feel I'm so close I could take sweet victory. I know this life meant for me. Yeah, why would you bet on Goliath when we got bet David? Value came in, giving values contagious. This world of entrepreneurs, we get no value to hate. It's how they run, homie. Look what I become. I'm the, I'm the one. Okay, so today we have a very uh, unique podcast here. Uh, we have some friends here. We were talking earlier to discuss the importance of the NBA and the greatest players of all time. That's what we're going to talk about. <laughs> it's, it has nothing to do with faith, nothing to do with religion, no discussion. But in all uh, 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 seriousness, I've been looking forward to this for a while. Um, I know it's it's a bit of a sensitive setup to to have it like this. We discussed it was supposed to be a different uh, couple, different individuals, brothers from your end coming in, and then Mohammed Hijab and I had a call together. We had a Zoom. He had some challenges, and uh, I got to give shout out to Eddie, uh, the Dean Show. He's here with us as well, but he's sitting outside uh, to have the discussion for us to be here together. Robert, uh, uh, I respect all of you for coming out. Truly, I respect you for coming out. My outcome, I want to first share with you and the audience what my outcome of this is. So as a father of four, I'm a little bit concerned on what's going on with the country in America. I escaped Iran. We went to Germany at a refugee camp, then we came here. I now have four kids, and I love America. I think this is an incredible nation. It's changed my life. Uh, but some of the things that's going on right now, it's kind of weird. It's strange. It's not normal. It doesn't seem normal to me. And I have friends. I'm a Christian myself. I'm a non-denominational Christian. People know that's my position. But I have a lot of friends that are Muslims. I have Scientologist friends. I have Mormon friends. I have Jews you know, who are here with us as well. Uh, so I wanted to bring this up because we're going to discuss a few different things today. Number one is the differences in the religion of uh, Christianity and uh, Muslim. We'll discuss that. And then uh, uh, we'll discuss the enemy. Who is the enemy to Christians? Who is the enemy to Muslims? And then we're going to share who our common enemies are. And some funny questions I want to ask you. We'll have some levity here as well to uh, enjoy the discussion. And then there'll be an opportunity for you guys to also discuss with each other. This is not a debate. This is a discussion. Of course, there's going to be moments of debate and you giving your point of view. That that's going to happen no matter what naturally uh, the setting is where that is going to happen. But I want to make sure everybody knows that's my outcome. I think there is an area where if we can find common enemies, the enemy's greater than we think. At the end, that's my outcome. But with that being said, let me properly introduce everybody. So first, we have uh, Danielle. Harirat Jew. I said it seven times <laughs> properly, and then when they were on, I can't. So Daniel Harirat Jew attended uh, Harvard University, where he majored in physics and philosophy. He is a Sunni Muslim debater who specializes in debating anti-Muslim figures. He founded MuslimSkeptic.com and teaches Islam at mosques and universities around the world. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Patrick. And he has a book here as well, The Modernist Menace to Islam. We'll put the link below as well, Rob, so if people want to pick it up, they can. And then we have Jake Brancatella, right, who is here with us. I was telling him earlier, I'm used to that last name more often with some of the friends we interview. <laughs> he is the Muslim metaphysician, is a convert to Islam. He holds a BA in philosophy and is currently studying for a master's in philosophy and theology. Jake primarily debates Christians and atheists and is an active member of the Muslim Debate Initiative. Then we have Brother Rashid here to my right. He wrote a book called The Ideology uh, Behind Islamic Terrorism, a Moroccan Christian convert and the host of the Daring Questions television program where he discusses Christianity and engages with Islamic theology and religious to topics. Brother Rashid, thanks you for being here. Thank you for having me. And last but not least, Robert Spencer, American author and commentator known for his writings of Islam, counterterrorism, and his involvement with the organizations like Jihad Watch, the most popular blog within the counter-jihad movement. He's also written the truth about Muhammad. He's written uh, a, a critical Quran and also his latest book that's, I think, is that the critical Quran you have out here? Quran. And he's written a few other things. Rob, again, once again, uh, thank you for being here thank as well. You. So what I'd want to do is, uh, before we get started, <coughs> it, you know, and I have some comments and questions here, if, if you, you know, just for some of the audience that maybe they don't know the whole story, we can start off with anyone on how you came about your current position right now. If you can take 30 seconds to a minute, given your background, and then we'll go from there. So we're going to start off with you. 
Uh, Robert, how did you go? I've read your story. Of course, I know your background. I watch a lot of commentary on you. How did you become the person that you are today? Well, you know how one thing leads to another. And I was uh, fascinated with Islam and the Islamic world from a very early age because uh, my grandparents actually uh, are from the Ottoman Empire. They were Greek Orthodox Christians in what is now Turkey and were exiled during World War I for not converting to Islam. When I knew them, actually, my grandmother was the only person besides Barack Obama who said that the, who I knew, who said that the call to prayer, the Islamic call to prayer was the most beautiful sound that she had ever heard. And she was, would tell me stories about growing up in Turkey and how wonderful it was and how beautiful the land was, how wonderful the people were and so on. And so then I would ask the inevitable question. I was you know, five years old or whatever. Well, then why are you here? Why did you leave? And then they would clam up and not tell me. So this just made me more interested, started to study it, consulted with people, ended up consulting with some people in the 90s about these issues. And then after 9-11 was asked to write a book. And now I've written 27 books, mostly on this issue. And I, I watch you where you, you have a certain level of true 100 percent belief in, in what you're talking about. We'll get into that here in a minute. And I'm sure I'm sure we'll get more uh, about that. Brother Rashid, how about yourself? Yes, I grew up uh, in Morocco. My dad was an imam for a mosque and I was uh, Muslim like every other Moroccan. At age of 12, I was listening to a radio program. That's when I heard about Christianity and I started comparing between Islam and Christianity. I was fascinated with the person of Jesus in the Gospels. And uh, um, I was shocked with the life of Muhammad when I compared it to the life of Jesus. Then I converted at age of 16, 17. Then I had to um, leave my family, actually. They rejected me. I lived as a homeless for two years. And I had to live underground with the Moroccan church, the converts, until uh, 2005, I had to flee the country. 2005, you have to flee the country. Yeah. Okay. And we'll get into your stories about a little bit more when topics come up. Uh, 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 Jake, how about yourself? What's your story? What's your background? Yeah, so I was uh, raised a Roman Catholic. Uh, my entire family is Roman Catholic up until today. Um, I personally never really believed in the religion, primarily because the theology never really made much sense to me. Uh, As I grew older in my late teens and going into the university years, I naturally, you know, the mind starts to think about the deeper questions in life. What's the purpose of life? Does God exist? What religion is true? And so I went on this search and eventually found the path of Islam primarily because I believe that it's the only religion today that truly supports pure monotheism. Um, I know that Christians, and maybe we'll get into this in the discussion, claim to be, but um, I found doctrines like the Trinity and Incarnation to be completely uh, incoherent and found problems with them. And the Islamic narrative of there being one and only true God uh, that is worthy of worship and that he sent prophets and messengers um, with this consistent message throughout time uh, was very inviting to me and fit with my natural disposition. And I became a Muslim in my early 20s about 10 years ago and been Muslim ever since. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Daniel, how about yourself? Yeah, my background is my parents uh, came from Iran. They're both from Shiraz. I was born in the U.S. actually and was raised here um, in Houston, Texas. And I love my parents. um, And they raised me like an Iranian, had a strong Iranian Persian identity. Uh, As I was in high school and then college, I started to become more religious, like learning about my background from my grandparents, for example, from my dad. And I just became more religious, started practicing Islam. I became Sunni, so I'm from a Shia background. I became Sunni. And uh, in college, I went to Harvard University. There was a lot of pressure on Muslims at that time Mm Uh, because of like the war on terror, counterterrorism efforts. Mm -hmm. And there was this effort to liberalize Islam and to say that traditional Islam or the Quran uh, or the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, this is their teachings are not consistent with modern life, with modernism and liberal secularism. And this posed a conflict for me. Like, how do I reconcile a traditional 
Islam with liberalism, secularism, and these modern ideologies. So I went and studied philosophy, and I became critical of these ideologies, like modern, liberal, secularism, humanism, atheism, mm -hmm. these isms, and, and that's you know the title of my book, basically, or a subtitle of my book, is critiquing these isms that I believe, uh, and through my study, <clears throat> they're destroying humanity. Not just Islam, but just all of humanity is under threat from these <coughs> isms that are destroying human society. I hope we can talk about that uh, today. But I dedicated my uh, career, basically, to promoting this message, teaching Islam, teaching how Islam solves many of the problems and difficulties that all people face in society, not just Muslims. I love that. Okay, thank you for that. Again, uh, gentlemen, thank you for sharing your background. So let's get right into it. Uh, Robert, your challenge, what is your biggest challenge with the religion of, religion of Islam? What's your biggest challenge with it? You mean the biggest, the biggest difficulty I see in it? I would say the biggest difficulty because to me, <laughs> I see it from a, a few different places, right? One, there's faith, meaning none of us have gone to heaven to see what heaven's going to look like. We're all taking a risk. All of us here are taking a risk. Uh, either we're all going to be right, either we're all going to be wrong, or either one of us is going to be right, meaning one group's going to be right and the other's going to be wrong. But we don't know. That's faith. That's prayer. Of course, we've had great experiences in life to say, I had a connection with God. I had a moment with that, that, that. And then that's individual to us, right? So to me, it's faith, it's religion, it's enemies, it's common enemies, it's the challenges that's going on in, in the world, specifically with America as being for the longest time the greatest country in the world. What is affecting that? And then there's a few other things that we'll talk about into as well. So, but for me, it's more from the standpoint of when, when, you, when you've, you've said you've read the Quran dozens of times, you have, you've studied it, you've written about it, you've talked about it. Even the, I think the government used two of your books in 2011 that Wire talked about, right? I don't know what the two books were. I think one of them was about Prophet Muhammad and, uh, you know. So your background, you've been in this world. What is your biggest challenge and differences with the religion of Islam? Well, you know, probably the main thing is the sanctification of violence and the idea that God will bless and even calls upon the believers to commit acts of violence under certain circumstances. Like Rashid here is an ex-Muslim, and so under Islamic law, as it's traditionally and classically formulated, he would be put to death. Uh, Muhammad said, anybody who changes his religion, kill him. Mm -hmm. And it's still the position of all of the schools of Islamic jurisprudence, Sunni and Shia, that the apostate should be put to death. Now, obviously, this is not something that means that every apostate has to always go around watching himself, because it, you have to have somebody who's willing to do that. But those who do do it, they think, oh, well, now I have done something that Allah has commanded, and he will bless me for doing it. And me, myself, because I was standing up for the freedom of speech, 2015, Pamela Geller and I put on in Texas a Muhammad art exhibit and cartoon contest. And it was actually, we featured a lot of classic Shiite Persian art depicting Muhammad, as well as contemporary art that is, was from a more critical standpoint. And a couple of jihadis came from Phoenix, uh, uh, key members, actually, of the Islamic Community Center of Phoenix. One of them was featured in a recruitment video for them, and they tried to kill us. And so I actually would be also under a death sentence just for drawing Muhammad and for sponsoring people who do, which I did not in order to cause gratuitous insult, but to defend the freedom of speech and freedom of expression, which is the foundation of any genuinely free society. Daniel, what would you say to that? What's your response to that? Yeah, so just to a few points here. Number one, it's interesting how we want to talk about Islam as a religion, but we the religion is 95% like what Jake mentioned. It's about worshiping God, being devoted to a righteous way of life, loving your neighbors, taking care of your parents. That's what 95% of, of Islam is about. Yes, there are criminal punishments, which we're going to discuss. There is um, conquest, there is war theory, there's all of this in Islam. But it's interesting how when a conversation is about Islam, we focus on that 5% instead of the 95% of what Islam is about. We don't see this kind of double standard with like Christians. So if you have someone like Matt Walsh, Matt Walsh is a traditional Christian. There's slavery in the Bible, there's punishment for blasphemers in the Bible, there's killing of heretics in the church tradition. 
There's no discussion of that with Matt Walsh, right? Or Ben Shapiro. There is killing of blasphemers in the Hebrew Bible. There is, you know, punishments for apostasy in the Talmud. There's no discussion of that with Ben Shapiro. You can talk about, you know, other values, and that's what the discussion focuses on. But the Islamophobic narrative is just lasering in on these specific topics, which is fine. We can discuss that, but I just want to note the double standard. So the other framing of this whole discussion that I want to put out here, though, is that um, I want, I'm wondering, like this standard of, oh, there should be no punishment for um, blasphemy, for example. Let's just put that out there. There should be no punishment for mocking and insulting a religion, attacking people's values. Is that coming from a Christian perspective? Is that coming from, a tradi is that coming from the church tradition? Is that coming from the Bible? Because when we look at the Bible, we see in Leviticus, we see in Deuteronomy that blasphemers should be put to death. Uh, even if you entice, you know, the Bible says, if you entice uh, like your son or your daughter or your wife entices you to worship other than God, then have no mercy. Put them to death without due process mentioned, without any kind of court or tribunal. The husband or the father should just immediately put them to death without mercy. That's what the Bible says. So when Robert wants to criticize Islam, I'm wondering, is that criticism on the basis of the Bible? Is that on the basis of the church tradition? Or is this a liberal, secular, modernist critique of Islam? So I want to know, am I debating or discussing with uh, two Christians or two atheists or two liberal secularists? Like, that's a clarification that we need. May I? I yes. Uh, this is a very important clarification. And there are a couple of distinctions that have to be made. One is all of your examples from Christianity are from Old Testament law which if you had studied Christianity, you would know there's no sect of Christianity, no school of, of Christian thought, no tradition within Christianity that holds that Old Testament law applies to Christians for all time. As a matter of fact, it never did apply. Even in Judaism, after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, the rabbis redefined Judaism so that the, even they don't teach that those punishments have ongoing validity. So you're talking about something that is that nobody in mainstream Judaism or Christianity thinks is valid today versus something that unfortunately all too many Muslims do think is valid today. And the bringing up of ancient historical wrongdoing is all very well. And there's certainly a place for that. I've got no interest in denying any of the misdeeds of Christians throughout history. But the problem that we have in Islam is that these passages of the Quran that are problematic, passages of Muhammad's traditions that are problematic, they are still considered to be in force by very large numbers of Muslims, such that all the major terrorist groups around the world are Islamic groups. And you don't have any Christian terrorist groups saying Jesus is Lord and blowing people up. There's a reason for that. And the reasons have to do with the interpretive traditions in both religions. Can I comment? Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, so I would ask Robert a very simple <clears throat> question that I think gets at what the real issue actually is. Do you believe that it's inherently immoral for an apostate to be put to death? Do I believe that it's inherently immoral yes. for an apostate to be put to death? is it inherently immoral? Well, I know this is some kind of trap, but in any case, no, it's, I don't see any reason. No, I'm just looking for honesty on your part, that's all. You can always have honesty on my part. Everything I tell you is the truth. Okay, so And the fact is that, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I tell you the truth, you I haven't don't know. thought about wow. it. Okay, but, you haven't uh, thought about it. Well, you're writing yeah. all of these books on Islam talking how are you about criticizing apostasy, Islam? Right. and you don't even know if this is inherently immoral. That's quite shocking, no, Robert. I would say that I don't think that it's moral to put the apostate to death. So it's but immoral. as it comes to my books about Islam, I'm just reporting on what Islamic clerics and the Islamic tradition teaches about passages like when Muhammad says, if somebody changes his religion, kill him. So yeah, but if you look, for example, in chapter 4, verse 89 of the Quran, in the critical Quran, where it says, if they turn renegade, then come and kill them wherever you find them, then I give Islamic authorities who actually say that this should be done. And that is something people need to know. 
Now, whether you're talking about in the ideal society, you have apostates put to death, I don't think so because I believe in the freedom of conscience and the idea that the, of the dignity of the human person, which is a Christian concept that's not in Islam. You have in Islam, you know, the unbelievers are the most vile of created beings, according to well, chapter 98, verse 6. One issue yeah, yeah. so on. No, this is all I, I still let's didn't talk get about this. Issue. I, I understand, is but this is all the same issue. Whereas is in Christianity, all people are equal in dignity as made in the image of God. And so in, in that sense, I would say, no, I don't think it is. So can, is it inherently immoral, yes or no? Can I yeah. answer that? It is. It is. So can when the Bible, when Deuteronomy, since you like to quote the Quran, when the Bible says this in Deuteronomy 13, 6, if your brother, the son of your mother, your son of, or your son of your daughter, the wife of your bosom, or your friend, who as, as your own soul secretly entices you, saying, quote, let us go and serve other gods, which you have not known, neither you nor your fathers, of the gods of the people which are all around you, near to you or far from you, from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth, you shall not consent to him or listen to him, nor shall your eye pity him, nor shall you spare him or conceal him, but you shall surely kill him. Your hand shall be first against him to, to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all the people." And you shall stone him with stones until he dies, because he sought to entice you away from the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. So all Israel shall hear and fear, and not again do such wickedness as this among you. So yes. when let me let me finish. Let me oh, comment I get on your the point. passage. So when your loving God, Jesus Christ, who you believe is God, who revealed the Old Testament and revealed this as a law for the people, and you said that it's inherent inherently immoral for a, the punishment of apostasy to be death, then you are charging your own God and supposedly loving Jesus with immorality, not sir. At all. If you don't see that contradiction no. and hypocrisy, it's not in we the can't least. really do much for you. Well, it's not in the least contradictory or hypocritical because that is God actually ordering something Was directly. Was God wrong for that? Now, the question here is whether... The Muslims, when they put people to death for apostasy today, are auth likewise authorized by God in some direct manner. Now, oh, obviously, that's what matters. yes, the question is. Well, then it's not inherently immoral. It just matters what is the correct religion and whether or not well, see, God is actually revealing it. Yeah, if you study the Old Testament, you will actually find that there's a great deal of discussion about passages like that and whether they are actually commands by God, whether they were understood by the faithful interpretations by the faithful, the evolving understanding in the Old Testament and the New and in Jewish and Christian tradition is something that unfortunately is absent in Islam, such that in Jewish and Christian tradition you have the understanding of the dignity of the human person that ultimately made people realize that putting people to death for apostasy was not something that was acceptable. Yeah. But the idea that it was a localized command at some point or understood to be such, that is not the same thing as people nowadays thinking they are the executors of the wrath of Allah because Muhammad says, if anybody changes his religion, kill him. And the Quran says that you can soothe your, your, your heart by fighting the unbelievers yeah, so and I mean, so on. So, so, so Robert, uh, let, let me hear from Brother Rashid for yeah. one. Brother Rashid, yeah. go yeah. forward. What's on your yeah. mind? Because this is concerns me. Do you believe I should be put to death? I believe that the punishment for apostasy in a correct Islamic state is death. I believe that that's so the correct... Let you, me finish. Let me just respond, yeah. sir. I believe that that is the correct punishment which has been revealed by God both in the Quran and the Bible, and for Robert to turn around. I, I and asked say, you. Let, let me let me finish. I yeah, asked you. Do believe I should be killed and today? I, and I answered you, sir. I answered yes you, or sir. no? I answered you. Yes or no? I in answered you. I think you said yes. Yeah. 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 You answered me. In a proper Islamic <clears throat> jurisprudent uh, um, jurisdiction, yeah. an Islamic nation, all of the laws of Islam and the Sharia, as revealed by God, uh, should be applied. So, if we were in that kind of state, would you do including, it? Including, I'm not the one that with proper it. due process, with a proper court hearing, just like any nation of laws. 
the, uh, the laws of the Sharia should be applied, including the death penalty for not only apostates, but no. also blasphemers. You, you didn't answer me, yes or no? We did answer Yes, you. we did answer. Yeah, so I should be answer. killed. We did answer I deserve question. to be killed because I left Islam and became a Christian. According to Islamic law, an apostate like you would be killed, yes. Okay, thank you. And according okay, to the let Bible me, let me, well. let me, this is a fallacy. And a blasphemer. This is a fallacy. Robert, Too cockwee. Like, you want to say not you have it too. It's a fallacy. <clears throat> no. Let us discuss this because... Uh, Why our, is it a fallacy? Our, it's a fallacy. It's, it's let showing, me, let, let me finish, hypocrisy. let me finish, let me finish. Please condemn Jesus, yeah. please. Oh, you think you condemn Jesus. Robert already condemned him. No, you're lying. Let me finish. On let record, saying that's, you're lying let, about that. Let me finish. That's what happened. Let you said you, eventually you, you realized convert, you let, you're lying. Just let me finish. You converted your brother you're, Rashid, and then I'll come to you. Go for you it. You converted from Christianity to Islam. Your life is not under threat here in the U.S. I converted from from Islam to Christianity. My life is under death. That's the difference between Christianity and Islam. Okay, so let me Our, ask you this. Yes, I got a question for you guys. I'm a data guy. I'm a finance guy. How many Christians have died? Uh, going from being Christian to Muslim, how many Muslims have actually been killed or died going from being a Muslim to a Christian? There's no yeah. data on that because these kinds of things are not recorded. They're not considered crime. There should be, though, right? Islam. I mean, shouldn't be, I, shouldn't, there, there, even if there's some stories to be able to say, yes. you know, XYZ individual. I have stories. I have oh, one yeah, in funny. Mauritania who was condemned for to be executed. We just got him out to Paris because we negotiated with the government there. I have people right now in Libya. They are under death penalty in Libya. I have people who got killed in Jordan, for example, because I do my show. People contact me. I have people who got killed in Jordan. Their parents killed them because of they became uh, uh, Christians from, from a Muslim background. We have people in in different places in the world, in the Muslim community, they kill them. And if they get if they get to flee, that's the best outcome. I got a question. So, so the, while I'm studying this, there's also Daniel said something very interesting where the the guidelines of uh, 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 Quran is based on the jurisdiction of the government, meaning where you live, the religion is follow whatever the laws are of that nation. Meaning, uh, you, you can correct me. I'm just giving you what my uh, what I've looked into. Does this mean these rules apply no matter where you live? Is that across the board? Or is it it's more stricter in certain Muslim nations than other Christian nations? Islam is to be applied forever on every place since the time of Muhammad until today. So Muslims are just seeking to be a majority one day. And the, the, if Muslims are majority today, yeah. these two brothers will witness my killing in front of people. And they will be happy cheering the crowds that I was killed. So if, if, Islam if, is if to be... If the U.S. became majority Muslim yes, today, you would be killed. I will be killed. Uh, Sharia is to be applied everywhere every time and that's the biggest difference with Christianity because Jesus came and he stopped the Old Testament he stopped every he, he didn't stone the lady who committed adultery <clears throat> he didn't he said in in the law tooth for tooth and he said no you turn the other cheek Jesus stopped the Old Testament they don't have a New Testament in Islam they have worse than the Old Testament they have something that uh, Muhammad never corrected so today we have to do jihad today we have to kill the apostate today we have to to kill the person who who doesn't pray even a Muslim if he stops praying if he stops praying, he should be killed. If he has no excuse, he should be killed according to I'd Islam. I'd like to give them a chance to respond. Daniel, what would you say? Because the point I think you were making was how that maybe doesn't apply based on what the countries are. And then he makes a good point about saying, but if U.S. eventually becomes majority Muslim, then that could be the criteria that we have to follow in U.S. What's your response to that? Yeah, so there are a lot of inaccuracies in what he's talking about. I want to reframe the issue because he's saying that his life is in danger. But the lives of Muslims are in danger under a secular liberal hegemony. And I know that some of the viewers might not be following what I'm discussing, but look at the war on terror or even look at me personally or Jake. But I say things that are contrary to liberalism. I critique and criticize liberal secularism. And what is liberal secularism? It's the 
this philosophy that came out of the Enlightenment, out of the 18th and 19th century in Europe, and it was imposed on the entire globe by force through colonialism, through imperial wars. And the idea of liberal secularism is that we sh morality should not be based on these old books like the Quran and the Bible. We have to use reason and science to <laughs> maximize individual happiness, individual freedom and equality. And this is the best system of life. It's an atheistic system of life. We need to have separation of church and state, etc. This is the dominant, I don't want to say religion, but it's a dominant ideology in the world today. And it's imposed through, you know, the UN uh, Security Council, international rights law, etc. But it's coming from a very specific philosophy that is anti-religion. It's anti-Islam. It's anti-Christianity, anti-traditional Christianity. I criticize this system. And Muslims who criticize this system are put on watch lists. Are we're banned from traveling. Some of us are drone striked. Some of us are detained. Some of us are face all kinds of uh, canceling, deplatforming. Our livelihoods are threatened. I get death threats all the time. Almost every day I'm getting a death threat uh, because of my opposition to this hegemony, liberal secularism. There is no quote unquote freedom of religion because if you oppose this hegemony, if you oppose this system, you will be put to death. And I know you've had some very distinguished guests like uh, Glenn Greenwald, Whitney Webb, and they talk about this system. Alex Jones, they talk about this system. They might not put it in the same exact way that I'm putting it, but it is a this authoritarian, centralized, yeah. theocratic, uh, not theocratic, technological system. And yes, plenty of people are getting killed. What was the Iraq war about? What was the Af Afghanistan war about? How many millions of Muslims were killed because of those invasions? What were those invasions justified on the basis of? It wasn't on the basis of the Bible. I wouldn't put that on Christians. I would put it on spreading freedom, spreading democracy, spreading liberal values and quote unquote women's rights. That's what millions of Muslims in the past 20 years have been killed for, slaughtered, genocided because of this ideology. So yes, Muslims are under threat. Muslims are in far more un threat than you know the few Christians here and there that might uh, leave Islam to become Christian. Go for it. Uh well, in the first place, when it comes to secular liberalism, Daniel and I are completely in agreement. We're both against it. We both see that it's evil. And uh, in that sense, you know, you were talking about working together, finding common ground. That is the common ground that we have. Uh, the idea of the invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan were completely wrong, com based on false premises, false assumptions, uh, based on the idea that they could bring democracy to the Islamic world. It was never going to happen. I was warning about it before it started, but uh, was not heeded. But the fact is that, uh, and also uh, when it comes to death threats, we could probably have a contest and see, but I get them many, 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 many daily, mostly from Muslims, but not always. And the left is increasingly unhinged and out of control. But if Daniel is positing that Islam is somehow the alternative, then I would wonder how is it that all the Muslim politicians in the United States, including a Sharia, an obvious publicly Sharia adherent, one like Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib as well, Keith Ellison, uh, the uh, Andre Carson, the publicly Muslim uh, Quran adherent politicians, and yet they're all very far on the left, and they're aiding this secular liberal monster that Daniel so rightly opposes. And so it's hard to see how uh, Islam can be the remedy when you don't even have a single politician uh, of the Islamic faith who is standing against all that. Brother Rashid, <laughs> what, what's, your, what's your biggest criticism of, because uh, you were a, a Muslim before yeah. and you converted... What was your biggest reasoning for doing so? But my biggest reasoning, and I, I want to comment on a point that I forgot to comment last time. Uh, our brother, he said the 5% of Islam we're <clears throat> focusing on. Right. If you have this glass of water and you have 95 for it is water, but 5% is poison, it's going to kill you. So this is, this is exactly what we have with Islam. Yes, you can talk about God, you can talk about worshiping, but how about violence against people like me? How about violence against Christians and Jews? You are, you are ordered to wage war against them. That's what happened to my ancestors in Morocco. Berbers, they were Christians. 
They were executed. They were enslaved. That's what happened to people in Egypt, in Iraq, in Syria, and even in Europe. How about that? How about um, uh, people who, uh, for example, uh, against women, Islam against women? And women, we should and note that they endorsed wait, the death penalty for apostasy right here. Yeah. Let me just finish. As does Jesus and, Christ. And, and, and against women, women should be beaten if they disobey their, their, their uh, husbands. My mom was beaten, my imam dad. When I asked him why, he said, it's in the Quran. You cannot object to that. They cannot object to it. It's in the Quran. It should be applied. It's a permission for men to beat his wife. It's in the Quran. It's the word of Allah himself. Uh, again, when I studied the life of Muhammad, in 10 years, he waged 83 wars in 10 years, 27 wars and 56 raids in 10 years. And you are going to teach me that Islam is peaceful? No, it's not peaceful. Are you going to give a Nobel Prize for somebody who waged 83 wars? No, you will not. And, and another thing, Muhammad is not a rule model. Jesus is. Muhammad, he had many wives, 11 of them. One of them, she was nine years old. He was 53. I am 50. I cannot marry a girl that has nine years old. You cannot. That's abuse. And Muhammad did that. Can we do uh, one, so many one things. Uh, let me, le, let me, let me finish time. this. He took, he raided a Jewish tribe. He killed the whole family of a newly bride called Safiya. And he took her as a wife the same time he was returning to Medina. Would you put that as a role model for me today in the 21st century? He had another wife called Rihanna. My daughter, her name is Rihanna. I named her specifically for that. He took a Jewish wife, Rihanna, and he, he, he did sex with her. Not with her will. He did against their wills. All these ladies. Are you going to put him as a role model? You cannot compare Jesus with Muhammad. Jesus never killed a person. He never killed an apostate. He never waged a war. So he was a role model for me. And that's why I loved Muhammad and I wanted to follow Jesus. They are going to keep trying, bring the Old Testament. Name one person that Jesus killed because he was an apostate. Judas, he, he, he gave him to the Jews and he never ordered his disciple his disciples to kill him. I have people who just criticized Muhammad once and he ordered his disciples to go and kill him, even lying. His name is Kaab ibn al-Ashraf. He's a Jewish guy. They killed him, they lied to him, they took him and they killed him. He, he, he even encouraged a guy who was blind. He killed his wife, he had two kids, and he killed her. He came to the prayer and he said, he said uh, uh, Muhammad praised the guy for killing his own wife just because she criticized Muhammad. So they, these are the rules that they want to apply today. If we criticize Muhammad, we should be killed. Like what happened with the Charlie Ibdu. Do you think those people, they just killed the, the people who drew the caricature for Muhammad just because of, uh, uh, like that? No, because it's written in, in, in Islam that they should kill people who criticize Muhammad. So Islam is a big problem. Even the 5% can kill whole humanity. Can, can I have a response? Sure, I please go for it, Jake. Um, and I want to comment on what he said and also Robert's, Robert's remark about us endorsing the uh, punishment for apostasy. Yes, we do. Why? Because our claim is that we are actually faithful to our scriptures. You guys are not. You want to avoid the Old Testament, and I want to give you an analogy, uh, Patrick, because you're a business guy. You have many businesses, okay? And you have policies that you have to put in place based on social interaction in the workplace and all that kind of stuff. Now, you may make amendments to those policies based on new data, new information, how things are actually going based on uh, those things that you put in place. Now, when you do, right, and, and this is the analogy between the Old Testament and the New Testament, are you willing to say that, well, yeah, 
uh, thinking to myself, yeah, Pat, yeah, you were wrong, actually, when you said it was okay to do such and such. That was actually wrong, and you then put in the correct one. With the Bible, the problem that you have is the same one that you want to talk about, the loving Jesus Christ himself, which we also adore and respect as a prophet, is the same one that you believe is God and revealed the Old Testament, and you can't get out of that. So when your God, Jesus, revealed at that specific time, as I just read the passage, and I can read you plenty more where he says to kill babies in war. Is it okay to target infants in war and kill babies? Is that inherently immoral? The problem that you have is if you go on, and this is why the argument is so important. It's not a two quote just as a fallacious argument. It's checking for your consistency as a Christian, whether or not you're actually faithful to your own text and tradition. And the reality is you're not. Why? You have two options. If you condemn it as inherently immoral, then the whole Bible's gone. Because if you believe that those Bibles were, that those verses in the Bible were revealed by God, then you're saying that God is immoral. And on the other hand, if you say that it's not inherently immoral, but God changed the law at this time, then most of your arguments lose the force that they have against Islam because you can no longer argue that it is inherently immoral to punish an apostate by death and all of the other things that you want to tack on. This is why it's so important. It's not a fallacious argument, and the reality is we want to stick to our text and our tradition, and for the most part, we would argue that the Christians have abandoned them in favor of secular, liberal, moral ideologies. Let me have let me have Daniel respond, and then I'll come to you. Go for it. Yeah, so there are a lot of things that we need to respond to because he's just listing every grievance that he has against Islam. Right. We have to take it step by step. But just on this point of violence, you know, I think Jake makes really the crucial point. It's that Jesus, according to the Christian belief, Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. And he's the one who's commanding Moses, for example, to uh, ethnically cleanse the Canaanites or the Amalekites or all of these other tribes and to conduct conquests and war, to take girls as slaves, to take virgins as slaves. This is in the Old Testament, sure. So you have to deal, Christians have to deal with that moral problem. A lot of Christians, unfortunately, they just throw the Bible under the bus. And, That's you know, how is that plan. justified? But it's not just the Old Testament. It's also the New Testament. The New Testament also has endorses slavery. The New Testament also has the book of Revelation where Jesus is going to come, which, by the way, Muslims also believe that Jesus is, is the Messiah. He is the uh, born of the Virgin Mary, and he's going to come as the Messiah to establish God's kingdom on earth. Muslims also accept and believe that, and we're anticipating that. But he's going to be very violent. <laughs> It's going to be a very violent affair, and that's in the Muslim tradition, in the Hadith, and it's also in the book of Revelation. So Jesus is also very violent. And then finally, you have canon law. You have the church tradition. So if Robert wants to denounce canon law, because when you have canon law, it has slavery. It has a marriage age of 12 years old in canon law. It has um, punishments for blasphemy. It has even, um, you know, striking the wife, the disobedient wife. That's found in canon law from Gratian. So um, I believe that Robert is an Orthodox Christian. If he wants to denounce canon law and denounce his own tradition, he can denounce that. He can denounce uh, Jesus himself. He can denounce the Old Testament. He can denounce the Bible. Uh, the New Testament, that's fine. That's fine. He says that, oh, well, our religion adapts, our religion changes. But that's actually the problem, Patrick. You know, when we're talking about wokeism, when we're talking about like, if you can say that, oh, well, you know, that's the Re Old Testament is for those times. It's not applicable now, right? That's, that's the argument, the violence, the killing, the killing of blasphemers. That's for old times. We've changed, but Muslims are not willing to change. I say, yeah, Muslims are willing to stand by revelation. The problem with a lot of Christians, not all Christians, a lot of Christians, Jews, Hindus, they all have these practices in their books. Buddhists, they all have these practices, and they're pressured to change and update. And so why, if you can get rid of the conquest and the violence and the punishment for apostasy, why not just get rid of the prohibition of like cross-dressing, the prohibition of homosexuality, the prohibition of drag queens? Why prohibit any of that? Like maybe times are different. Maybe we need to adopt drag queen story hour in our church. Maybe we need to adopt, you know, all of these woke practices. Why not? And, and Robert, here's what I would say. You're making a very good argument. And I can totally feel where you're coming from as well. Uh, obviously, just so everybody knows, 
Have we ever had a conversation together prior to this debate? I just want everybody that's watching. No. Have you and I ever spoken? We just no. met a few minutes ago. No. Yeah. Have you and I ever spoken? No. Have you and I? No. I did that intentionally. I did that intentionally because I wanted to be the first interaction we have where it's not like, well, you know, <laughs> this topic, do you want this, do you want that? And nobody was given additional topics or what. You just kind of came in, we're going to talk, we're going to have this discussion. Again, I respect you guys for doing this. I think the part I agree with Daniel, and it could be a, it could be a leak, it could be a flaw, or it could be a, a strength as well as the following. The, what I'm noticing between the two faiths is one seems to be more intolerant more intolerant, and the other one's more tolerant. Let me unpack that from my perspective. For the longest time since I uh, became a, uh, since I started praying September of 1997, I've prayed for four things. Courage, wisdom, tolerance, understanding. The last six months, I've been having a hard time praying for the third thing, which is tolerance. Uh, and the reason for it is because I think Christians are becoming way too tolerant. Now, the standards could be extreme. Somebody could be watching and saying, guys, what are you talking about? You mean to tell me you're okay to hit your wife and do this and do that and apostasy and all this stuff? That's ridiculous for you to think that. And you may say, well, look, we're at least staying committed to our faith. They're not. They're picking and choosing what they like, and they're not. That could be the argument. All I'm saying is that's their argument, what they're yeah, saying. Yeah. But then the other side is when you're saying what you're saying, you know, stats came out right now as well about uh, Pew Research <clears throat> on statistics on Muslims' view on LGBTQ. You're now going to go through this as well with your faith, with your religion. Pew Research says that 52% of American Muslims believe homosexuality should be accepted by society. This is according to Pew Research. Among Muslim American millennials, that jumped to 60%. This was done in 2017, so it's six years old, which I would assume it's even higher today than what it was then. The survey also revealed that Muslim women are much more accepting of LGB people than their male counterparts. They're at 63%, men are at 42%. Just so you know the difference between women and men, about 21% difference. And a vast majority of religious LGBTQ Americans are Christians, split to, uh, fairly amongst Catholics, 25%, Protestants, 28%, and Christian denomination, 24.5%. Only about 2.5% uh, uh, of Jews uh, uh, are for it, and 2% are Muslims. Okay, So he makes the point that you know, you are more tolerant of a religion of, when I say you, you're not representing everybody in a Christian. You could be your own kind of a Christian. Yeah. There's different, you know, sects in a Christian. But I, from an outsider watching in and trying to be as fair as possible, I see we're not being tolerant. You're not going to say anything about our prophet. You're not going to say anything about our religion. We're going to defend this. These are our values. We're going to protect it. We're going to fight for it. This is important to us. This is our livelihood. This is what we stand for. And Christians are like, ah, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Ah, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Ah, it's okay. Don't worry about it. And then it's bringing out more flaws and arguments in the Christian religion. And I'm saying this as a Christian myself. What, what, what's your rebuttal to that? Well, what you're talking about in a large part is a retreat from and a rejection of Christianity, not actual Christianity. Christianity stands for certain values, stands for certain principles, and when the West was Christian, then you didn't see all this craziness that you see in the society today. It's when the West starts to discard Christianity that all these things come in. Like Chesterton said, when people stop believing in God, it's not that they believe in nothing, they believe in anything. And we're seeing that illustrated every day now with increasingly insane public discourse coming from the left and especially a social discourse. But this is not Christianity. Now, to be sure, you're absolutely right. There are a lot of leftist and liberal Christians who have essentially discarded Christianity. Yeah. And under the guise of Christianity, it's kind of like invasion of the body snatchers Christianity. You remember that movie? Mm -mm. People would appear and they looked just the same, but the space aliens had taken their personalities and replaced them. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have with a great deal of Christianity today. Unfortunately, it's been infected by exactly this kind of liberalism. And so a lot of people turn away thinking that's Christianity when actually these people are not Christian in anything except the name. But there's a great deal more that Daniel mentioned. Am I going to get a chance? You to can. You well, can respond right now. Okay. Yeah. The uh, thing, the problem that you guys have is that you're reading the Bible as if it were the Quran. In the Quran, it's dictated. Every Allah dictated every word, and it's applicable for all time. It's all flattened out and on the same level. The Bible is simply not like that. In the first place, you have the very simple notation of the Gospels, the Gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, in the Christian faith, my, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were inspired, but that doesn't mean that God was dictating to them 
and that it was beyond their human understanding. Like when St. Paul in one of his letters, and he says, I'm glad I didn't come to baptize any of you. Well, actually, I did baptize a couple people, and I forget who else, but I still didn't come to baptize. It's not that God is forgetting who he baptized and who he didn't, but Paul is working from his human understanding, and yet he is speaking the truths, the eternal truths that God wants him to communicate. A lot of the Bible is the record of the evolving understanding of the people of God about precisely a lot of these issues that you're talking about. And so you can't go back and flatten it out as if it were the Quran and say, Jesus is here telling people to kill people, and therefore you have to approve of it. Well, Jesus That's is just not how the Bible works. What you have is an understanding that the people had at that time that's expressed in that way, and then later, because of the teachings that Jesus gives in the New Testament primarily, of the dignity of the universal dignity of the human person, and of various other aspects of the understanding of humanity. That's why slavery is abolished, and slavery was only abolished in Christian contexts, primarily in, in the UK and the United States to start with, and then it followed around the world, because people understood, even though slavery is in the Bible and in the New Testament, yes, at the same time, also, there's the idea that all people are made in the image of God and have that dignity. So there's not the dichotomy like in the Quran, Muhammad is the apostle of Allah, those who follow him are merciful to one another, ruthless to the unbelievers, at chapter 48, verse 29. So in the, it was Christian clerics in the UK and the United States who led the fight to abolish slavery based on the deeper Christian principles regarding the dignity of the human person. Yeah, so why can't it, you so, evolve? Why can't Christians evolve to accept transgender well, and drag queen story? Or because, why can't things evolve even more? Actually, What's the because principle? of the same... What's the principles? Yeah, articulated it's a good question. I'm trying to answer it. There's a, there is, it's because of the same principles. The idea of human transgender... Dignity. Yeah, human dignity, and that means both physically and spiritually. And so you take the transgender business, that's a total rejection of trust in God and the idea that God knows what he's doing when he creates somebody male and female. And that's the first thing the Bible tells us about God, that he created the heavens and the earth and that's created LGBT human beings. Christians say. And well, sure, LGBT and that's why they're wrong. Human dignity that male and female, he created who we them. Are and being tolerant for who we are. Yes. That's what they, what they claim. Well, that's you why have we articulated have, we have heresies. A very clear-cut principle. We have heresies in Christianity, just will, like you do in Islam. Uh, no, no, but I want to understand what is the principle that I was just telling you. That you just if you have human dignity. You, you're talking over me, but I'm trying to explain it to you. Because you're not that, answering that the has, question. No, I actually am answering the question, but you keep interrupting me and making it impossible for me to make my point. Give me point. the principle. So if you had the basic courtesy to be quiet for a second, then I will return it to you when you respond. Sure, go but ahead. But the idea that when, when, when it says male and female, he created them, that's not just an incidental point, but that is fundamental to the human human identity and to the nature of the person that has that dignity as being made in the image of God. And consequently to say, oh no, God made a big mistake and I'm really a woman, that is a fundamental rejection of any kind of Christian principle. That's not what transgender said. Let me ask a question here uh, for the point. I, mean, I want to transition off this topic to the next topic. By the way, you know how the Constitution, we've had 27 amendments in the last however many years we've been around, right? Based on what he just said, my interpretation of what he said is the religion of Christianity has made many amendments over the years, okay? Somebody could interpret as the New Testament as a form of an amendment. You can push back. I'm just giving the audience trying to see what the average audience may be thinking about. They may say, no, the Quran is the Quran is the Quran. We follow what was taught back in the days, and we're sticking to it, and there's no amendments. What's your rebuttal to that? Can I comment Go on this? It, please. Can yes. I, you understand for, what I'm saying, yeah, right? Yeah, you understand, understand the question. I understand the question. First of all, they are talking about amendments. They have something in Islam called abrogation. It's like an amendment. God says something, and then he changes it. For example, he asked the question, was it moral to kill the apostate? I can ask him the same question. How about Zawaj al muta Like you marry... For like it was practiced in Iran a lot. Uh, you it's just, not inherently immoral. Uh, it's not we inherently immoral. That. Why? We can answer it. Why? Why it was stopped? Why Muhammad stopped it? No, no, if it was immoral. The difference. The, uh, I'm just giving you an example. You let asked me, us let, the question. No, so no, I'll, I'll, I'll let you answer. 
I'll let you answer. In, in Christianity, Jesus came. He stopped so many things in the Old Testament. That's our principle. He stopped, for example, sacrifices. We don't sacrifice animals. He stopped the adulterers to be stoned. He stopped so many things, like tooth for tooth. He stopped that. So Jesus stopped so many things in the Old Testament. You don't accept that. That's, that's, that's your choice. For example, why his disciples never killed an apostate? Why his disciples never They didn't waged... have political power. As soon as Christians the, gained the, political power the, in the Roman the, Empire, they started doing these okay. things. You, you they didn't have the jurisdiction to do so. You, they didn't kill They were the anybody. minority. No, no. They weren't in power. No, no, as the, soon as Christians gained power the, within the Roman the, Empire, they, the, they applied the Old Testament the, laws, the New Testament it's law. It's not true. It's codified the, in the canon law. Do you know, are you familiar with the canon there, law? Yeah, yeah I, I want to talk okay. about that. Let, 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 yeah, let please finish. explain the canon law. Brother Rashid, if you can get closer to the mic so the audience can hear you. Uh, Jesus never waged a war. He never ordered one. There were other. There were there were other Jews uh, who did fine. who did kill uh, Romans and who, who did kill people zealots, the the, the, the people called Gaiorun. So um, Jesus never ordered that. His disciples got killed, not waged war. They got killed. They never killed a person. Slavery, uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, he said, in Jesus, there is no slave or free. And that's why the, the abolitionists, uh, they, they started in the West. I have a question for you. You are benefiting from human rights and freedom of religion in the U.S. And you are trying to get us back to Sharia. For example, you converted from Christianity to Islam. Alhamdulillah. And you want... To bring a law that kills the apostate? Do you want to be killed for converting from Christianity to Islam? Do you want that? Do you believe it's correct? Do you want it? <laughs> Yeah. You believe it's correct. So Explain he doesn't the answer principle. the question. Do you Give want us the it? Principle. Give us the, the principle. The principle is the golden principle. rule. Do not do to people what do you okay. don't want them to do so, to so, you. So you talk for a long time. Can I respond, please? Okay. Both of you keep running from the Old Testament and the argument that I've given. Jesus have, stopped it. We are we, not running. We Jesus you, stopped we let it. You, we let you speak for a while, sir. Please let me talk. Okay. Is Jesus God? Well, yes, the answer is yes. You do believe that. Did God reveal at least parts of the Old Testament? Well, of course you believe that. Now, Robert wanted to make a distinction. He brought up an example about Paul trying to remember how many people he baptized. Is, baptized. But in the Old Testament, when it says that God is speaking and that God commanded X, was that just somebody making it up or misremembering? No, the Bible says it's God. So listen to this passage. 1 Samuel 15, 1 to 3. And Samuel said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, Israel. Not, oh, I'm just talking at it, you know, my backside. Now, therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. Who are they? They're the words of the Lord. They're not the words of Samuel or your neighbor John or whoever else. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, <coughs> ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Donkey. So do not tell me, sir, that God, Jesus, did not order the killing of innocent people. He Not only did he do that, he ordered the killing of babies, none of which you will ever find anywhere in the Quran or Sunnah. So if you what? have a problem, let me finish, sir. You don't have it in let Sunnah? Me, let, me, let me finish, sir. If you have a problem with God ordering death for apostasy and all these other things that you're bringing up, Robert, when you bring up the issue of Paul, well, he's trying to remember how many people he baptized. Is that analogous to this text where a prophet Samuel is explicitly saying that these are the words of the Lord? Was Samuel lying? Did God actually say this? And if so, is killing babies inherently immoral when at war? Yeah, killing babies is bad, Jake. Yeah. Is it inherently immoral? Yeah. So why did your God order why the... Did Jesus why did, order why did no, your see, God, Jesus, the problem command? You have, order it. The, why did your God, the problem Jesus, you have command once again, the killing of infants? If you'll let me Jesus. answer, the problem that you have, once again, is that you're reading the Bible as if it were the Quran. And see, these things actually trouble 
Jews and Christians. There is no, no uh, uh, reason to cover up that fact that these passages have caused difficulty Why is it for problem? Jews and Christians throughout history. And some people would say, actually, these things never happened at all. That they were, uh, Do you they were, that? they were fables designed to teach. Do you believe that, that they were fables designed to teach Look. that you are to be completely pure and reject sin, and that all that business about killing this one and that one is about rejecting various well, we sins? We want to know your position. now. The whole point of what I'm saying here, if you would stop interrupting for a minute, I did not interrupt you. The whole point of what I'm saying here is that these passages, precisely in the fact that they have caused trouble for Jews and Christians and have led to differing interpretations of them, demonstrate that the Jews and Christians both have an evolving understanding that comes from later revelations and that comes from their own in, under, interpretation of the revelations that they received, such that they can say unequivocally that, yes, killing innocent people is wrong. Whereas you have Muhammad and they ask him, you know, you're, you're, you're throwing rocks, you're catapulting stones into the infidel's city. And you might, they got women and children in there and he says, oh, they're among them. In other words, you know, it doesn't really matter if you kill women and children because they're all infidels. And you don't have any kind of critical stepping back and saying maybe that is not to be. That's the one I'm talking can, can about. You, can you read this to him? He yeah. said, there's yeah. no permissibility. And one in, nowhere, yeah. nowhere in Sunnah. Just read it, please. This is him. Sahih Muslim, yeah, which is one of the, the yeah. hadiths. Permissibility well, you there of is killing no, women and children text. in night raids. Can you so stop from the beginning? Stop from the beginning. Go for read it. The text. Will you stop interrupting me? I did not interrupt you. Permissibility of killing women and children in night raids, so long as it is not done deliberately. It is reported on the authority of Saab ibn Jathama, that the prophet of Allah, when asked about the women and children of the polytheists being killed during the night raid, said they are from them. And this is Sahih Muslim 1745 a and that once I make the point, yeah, that that is giving permission. And that actually was invoked by Zarqawi, the Al-Qaeda leader in Iraq, when he was explaining why women and children were killed by the jihad bombings. And he was actually justifying it among Muslims. And he invoked that passage. Okay, I mean, so, so, so the difference is if you actually read the next hadith afterwards, it clarifies it, sir. And yes, if you're talking about bombardment or collateral damage in which an infant or child or a woman may be harmed inadvertently, not, yeah, inadvertently and unintentionally, then yes, that can happen. It's not a good thing that we enjoy in war, but if it happens, so be it. The difference is that in this text, it's specifically commanded from God. And what you said before, well, some Christians say, well, it's not actually historical. Maybe it didn't happen. Well, I don't care about other Christians with all due respect for this conversation. We're talking to the two of you and the two Muslims, and we are representing our positions. So we want to know from you, do you believe that 1 Samuel 15, 1 to 3 was revealed by God and that God himself ordered directly, intentionally for the killing of of babies and infants. Let me answer that. Let me answer that. You are judging a war that happened 3,000 years ago. Is it by this, uh, just, just wait. You are judging a war that happened 3,000 years ago by the standards of today. The difference between the Old Testament and Islam, we believe those applied for those circumstances and stayed there. They should not be applied today. Islam, jihad, should be applied in the time of Muhammad, today and forever. So killing the kids of polytheists, Muhammad answered, they are from them. They are just polytheists like them. So it's okay to kill them. And let me tell you about killing Killing kids, how you define a kid in the raid of Bani Quraida, 
Bani Khureyda, a Jewish tribe, Muhammad came and he said, check the hair of puberty for every kid. If you find one hair, you can kill him because he's considered an adolescent. So they killed 600 people on that day. You want to tell me? That doesn't exist in Islam. Yeah, I, I, I know it exists in Islam. And I know if you got authority today, you will do it. Here's what I want to do. I want to have Daniel give a response, and then I'm going to go to the next topic. Go for it, Daniel. Okay, so Banu Quraida, those that was a tribe that betrayed the Muslims in war. So that was an act of treason. Every legal system in history, every religion, when you do an act of treason and war, what is the punishment for that? Capital punishment. And that was what was applied. The punishment fit the crime. Uh, the point that Jake made is that the Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, explicitly forbade the intentional killing of women and children in the hadith that you didn't mention. So this is dishonest. Exactly. You read one hadith from the book of jihad in Sahih Muslim, but you don't read the other hadith. Exactly. So that is dishonest on your part, sir. Um, and then let's let's bring it back, you know, to the overall picture because for your viewers, many of them might not be Muslim or Christian. They think like both of you guys are crazy. Both of you, your religion sure. sound ridiculous. Yeah. So I want to defend not only traditional Islam but also traditional Christianity. You know, I want to defend. I think that's what bridging, uh, building bridges is really about defending traditional religion where every religion has conquest, it has violence, it has rules of war. And guess what? We live in a world of real politik. Every nation is engaging in war of conquest, expanding its influence and using violence as a means. The U.S. is the biggest perpetrator of that. The uh, Russia now is doing that in Ukraine, endorsed by the Orthodox Church, by the way. You have China, who is also expanding its influence. So Every society, every culture, every traditional religion says, yes, use means vi and violence if necessary to expand your influence and to conquer and to conquest and to impose, impose what? Your values. That is something universal. As Muslims, we're proud of that. Sorry, as Muslims, we're proud of that. We're proud of our religion, and we're not going to uh, reform it and modify it. It's only modern Christians, actually, and these other religions that are reforming their traditional beliefs in deference to what? In deference to this hegemony that I'm talking about, the liberal secular powers and saying, no, 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 our religion is just about peace. Our religion is just about like no violence, no nothing. Okay, you have to throw all your traditional texts right. under the bus. Muslims are not willing to do that. And, and, that's, and that argument has been made clearly and the audience has to decide which to them seems more of a uh, faith, which leads me to the next question a faith where you would want to raise your family in a country based on those values. So in America, when you look at the statistics, you'll see 20,000 uh, Christians have converted to Muslim, right? Of which 75% uh, uh, are women. With the number we'll see uh, three quarters are women and a quarter are men. Okay. The question I would have is I lived in Iran for 10 years. I don't know if you guys have lived in a Muslim nation before. Did you live? Did you, did you lived, obviously, you lived in Morocco. Have you lived in a Muslim? Uh, no. uh, you're here. So... I lived in Iran 10 years as a Christian family, and we would go to church, and I went to Christian school, and then we escaped and went to Germany, lived at a refugee camp with a lot of different sects from different parts of the world who were escaping. They were either escaping communism uh, or they were escaping not feeling safe, persecution for their religion, what they believed in. They didn't have the freedom. They left. Why, why is it? This is a question that's been brought up when I'm crowdsourcing what questions you want us to ask the guests that are here today. If it's purely statistical, why are more Muslims moving to Christian nations and not Christian nations moving to Muslim nations? Why do you think that is? It's economics, pure economics. If you look at Christians that move to Saudi and the Gulf, there's a huge influx of Christians from the Philippines, from Africa, from uh, Eastern uh, Europe that flock to the Gulf countries, Muslim countries. Why? Because of GDP, because of the economy. The influx of people of all religions and cultures to the US, to Australia, to Europe, it's purely because of economic opportunity, not because of there is some kind of better way of life. The way of life in the US, and I can talk to you because you lived 10 years in Iran, the culture of traditional societies, especially Muslim societies, is much more conducive to family. It's more of a family, community-based life as opposed to individualistic, you know, 
a rat race, everyone is out for himself type of lifestyle that you live in the West. And that's because of the hegemony that we're talking about, because of liberal secularism, because of this pursuit of happiness at the expense of all else. When you have a religion that values family, marriage, look at the divorce rates. Look at how, you know, I have five sons of my own. I'm very worried about will they even be able to find a wife? who will be faithful to them and who will want to have children, my grandchildren, who will be faithful. Look at the divorce rates. Look at the infidelity rates. Look at all of the social problems that are infecting Western societies. Why is that? I'd argue it's on the basis of leaving traditional Christianity, leaving traditional Islam, uh, reforming these religions. That's the problem. Look at someone like Reza Aslan. You interviewed him, I had him right? on, yeah. And you had a brilliant comment. You said that, Reza, when you're talking, I feel like you're an atheist. You're arguing, I don't think that you're actually a Muslim. Like, you're not talking like you're a Muslim. Mm -hmm. You're talking like this progressive, mm -hmm. liberal, atheist type person. And that's what's happening to everyone because of these political forces. And we have to resist that. We have to resist those kinds of influences in order to preserve marriage, preserve family, preserve community. That exists in the Muslim world, but it's being eroded. So, so why are you still here? Why are you in America? Why don't you go to a Muslim nation? I would like to do that. But the thing is that the West has declared war on every traditional society. Every tradi if you <clears throat> don't implement Western style, uh, liberal uh, human rights, quote unquote, like you don't legalize homosexuality, yeah. you don't legalize transgender, you don't legalize feminism, all these things that are destroying marriage and family, we're going to bomb you. We're going to sanction you. We're going to starve your people. It's not safe for Muslims to be in Muslim countries. It's not safe for traditional Christians. In tra traditional Christians quoting the Bible within Europe are being put in prison for quoting the Bible. They'll literally quote a, a verse from Leviticus or they'll talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. They're put in prison. This is a war on all traditional religions. And there's not a safe place for a traditional religious person in the world today because of this dominant global power. So your argument is, is economy, capitalism, you know, a capitalistic society. So then the question would be, why don't Muslim regions accept the principles of a capitalistic free society to be able to attract other Christians, you know, because when you hear some stories, it's... But I, I got that. Uh, uh, Brother Rashid, do you have a response to him on, on this question, specifically the question I'm asking? Why do Christian nations attract Muslims, but Muslim nations not attract Christians? Well, he said the economy is the first reason, yes. but, but um, other reasons exist too. I have seen so many Saudi girls leaving Saudi Arabia, going to Canada and the U.S. and the U.K., asking for asylum because they don't have the same rights, and they are forced to um, stay as a, a second-class status. Um, women is not treated well in, in Muslim countries. I have seen people who are leaving Morocco and other places because they don't have freedom of speech. And, and if you say anything against Islam in Egypt or, or Morocco, or for me, for example, why I left Morocco. I love Morocco. I would, love, I would love to live among my family, but I left not because of the economy. I was doing well. But because I don't have freedom of religion, and, and, and there are many countries that are like that. If you open the borders in Europe and the U.S., you have almost probably, I, I, I can't guess, but like probably 90% of Muslims will, will go to the West. Not just because of money. It's because of other reasons. They are oppressed there. And our brothers, they have the, the, their solution to what will live is not what I am here. Of course, we have a problem in the West, but the solution they are given is worse than what we have today. For example, LGBTQ, whatever, they will, they will kill them if we bring, let's say, let them govern with Islam today. They will throw them from a higher building. That's their punishment. I'm not with that. I'm not either this, the two extremes, either this or that. Islam is not going to give a solution. Why we have human rights in the West? Why every, everything we are enjoying today it came from the West? For example, women rights came from the West. Uh, uh, abolishing slavery came from the West. Uh, freedom of speech, freedom of religion came from the West. Uh, you name it, just give me anything. Dem democracies came from the West. So w they want us to live under an authoritarian uh, system 
and you cannot even question it. And if you say anything against it, you will be condemned to death. For example, if I say Islam is not the right way to God, I cannot say that in a Muslim country. I will be punished for that. So we are enjoying freedom of speech, freedom of religion, democracy. We can say our opinion. We can have a podcast like that without a problem. Guess what in Morocco? When I became a Christian, we met as Christians in closed doors. We couldn't sing. We couldn't baptize people. We couldn't name our kids Christian names. You cannot name him Luke or Mark or anything. You have to name him Muhammad and Omar and Abu Bakr. You can't name them Christian names. This is not I, true. It's true. I lived it. It's not. I it's lived in it. Islamic law. You, Okay, do you know Ahyam Ahlu Dhimma? Do you know the principles I'm not Ahlu of... Dhimma, I'm an apostate. Yeah, you, don't talk about other Christians. Well, Christians talk... can name their children. Okay. You lived in a, uh, okay, a Muslim I'm, I'm, country. Okay, Could let, let me finish. you be named Patrick, let or me, was that against the law? Let me finish. I am a convert <laughs> from Islam to Christianity. That's and different. I had, That's I had different. hundreds like me, girls and boys, they were, we were gathering, we were afraid of police, and we got arrested many times. We got interrogated. So let me get this straight. So, so I want to understand what both of you are saying. So for us... I was born in a Muslim country. My name is Patrick. My sister's name is Paulette. You're saying if a Muslim converts to Christian, you can't just name your kids anything. You have to name them those specific names. Yes. And you're okay with that. You think that's normal? I, I said something even you know more than that. I said that the punishment is death penalty. So forget it. That's what we talked about. No, at the beginning, right? Kapasa's totally get right. it. So, so for you, it's not even... Your level for that is for somebody to go, but why is that? But that's why? not the treatment of all Christians. So I that's totally get that, but why, why, why do you believe that? Why do you believe if a Muslim becomes a Christian is the death penalty? Why do well, you believe this that? is what I wanted to explain, is that, um, first of all, this is found in every religion. It's found in every culture. The idea that you have to have punishments for defection, meaning that if you abandon the group, you are threatening the group. And that's why every business, every university, every society has community guidelines, for example. Yeah. If you violate the community guidelines, it's not called blasphemy, it's called a violation of community guidelines, you're expelled from that community, you face consequences. But it goes beyond that because you have uh, restrictions on your speech, right? I can't. We can't look at you know this YouTube channel. I can't say certain things on this live stream, otherwise the video will be banned, your ch channel will get in trouble, and then you can be prosecuted. You can ha face all kinds of consequences. Again, go back to your Glenn Greenwald interview, your interview with Whitney Webb. Look at the power structures that restrict speech. They restrict thought. It, why? In order to preserve the power structure. Every religion has this. Traditional Christianity, ha that's why her heretics were punished. That's why apostates were punished in let me, Buddhism. Let me ask and, a follow-up on that. Sure, so so right. when, you, when you say to me, you know I've, I've interviewed almost any of the major living mobsters. I've had them on the podcast before. I don't know if that's your stuff that you would watch, but I've interviewed a lot of them. Sammy DeBull, Michael Francis, I've a lot them, of these yeah. guys. Okay. So I, I can see you with your last name. Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so. <laughs> so so when I interview these guys, one of the things that they have, and Sammy is a very much of a, he says, look, I'm a mafioso. I'm a true mafioso is what I am till today. He's in his late 70s. He still says that, right? If you step away from the life, like it's a, you could get killed if you step away from the life, right? Okay. You chose this life. You celebrate it when you become a made man. Now you want to leave? You got the benefits of being a made man. Now you want to leave? We're going to take your life if based on the principles that they followed. But that's the mafia. You, 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 for somebody that may say, well, then Islam is, you know, is Islam following some of the mafia philosophies that if you choose to leave, you deserve to get to lose your life? Don't you I, think that's would, a bit extreme? I would say the problem with the mafia is criminal activity. It's not with this principle. <laughs> this is a good principle. That's why they're able to be so organized. That's why they're able to be okay. so successful. That's the argument. And and you have nations that are run in the same way. You have to preserve the nation by punishing defection because it threatens the unity of the group. It threatens the way of life. That's tough, though, man. That's a t so, but so that's the law. That's I, the no, I, I, I totally right. understand it. All I'm saying is that's that's tough because, okay, so let me get to but, more the, the business side, the next side. On. Let me just add a little bit to Got it. Go for it. I will be killed, my kids will be taken, and my wife will be taken, add, just to add to the list, in, in, a, in an Islamic system. Let me continue with this. Let me continue with this a little bit, because this is getting interesting to me. So if, 
if in, in insurance, there's two ways to build or real estate. There's two ways guys build their real estate and their insurance companies. Let me explain this and you'll see where I'm going with this question. One is there's guys that steal from other people, okay? And they'll say, oh, you train those guys, I'll take your agents. You train those guys, I'll take your agents. You're getting 60%, I'll give you 80% if you come to my company. So their entire business model is to take from others, right? And then they're always capped because somebody else is not going to come and say, he gave you 80, I'll give you 100. And then so now they go to a different guy. And then the other guy will say, hey, he gave you 100, I'll give you 110. Then they'll realize there's only 130. So how much more is left to do? I'll give you 115 if you come to me five more. Okay, I'll come to you. And then eventually you're stuck. You're not going to go anywhere, right? Okay. So they're not, these agencies are not baptism agencies. They're converting agencies. I'll convert you to me by me giving you a better life or better heaven or better, you know, dream that I'm selling to you, right? For me, the way I see it is on, and then the other side is guys that recruit people from other industries and they make them realtors. So I'm working at Sears. You should consider getting a real estate license. I convert you. You're a nurse. You should think about being a realtor. I become a realtor. So you understand the two examples I'm giving. I'm recruiting other realtors. I'm converting somebody into being a realtor. Hence, religion, Muslim. I'm targeting Christians to convert them. No, I'm converting people that are, you know, becoming uh, uh, Muslims or just we're having more kids, and that's how we're going to grow religion. Okay. So the criticism and fear that a lot of Christians will say, non-Muslims will say is, if we go the way we do right now, one day Muslims are going to run the world. How, do, do you not fear that? And I, you, you'll hear that. Okay. And by the way, it's a fair argument because right now the number is, give or take, the Muslim population worldwide I think is around uh, 1.7 billion. And it's expected by 2060 to grow by 73 74% to 3.1 billion. Today they're 24.1% of the world population. By 2060, you'll be 31.1%. These are some real numbers that they're increasing. And Christians will say, well, do you not, are you not worried about that? Are you not worried about that? Are you not worried about that? Okay. So then my argument becomes, because I'm a data guy, Muslim women have 2.9 kids per woman. Christians are around 2.5, 2.6. Non-Muslims are 2.2. And you know the replacement game, you need to have 2.1. Yeah. So 2.1 is a replacement game. 2.2 is non-Muslims. Christians are 2.6, and then you have Muslims eating away 2.9. By the way, in the 90s, you were at 4.3, 4.5. In 1990, 1995, you, 30 years ago, you were at 4.5, uh, 4.3. So where am I going with this? So where I'm going with this is if this goes the way it does, and they do what they do, it is very natural that the Senate, that Congress, that House, that governors are going to be ran by Muslims. Right now, you have three that are there. You mentioned the names earlier. There used to be one in the past. That's four. But we had 82 in the midterm election who are Muslims that got elected to city, state, different kind of jobs that they had record-breaking ever, right? So if I don't look at it from the faith standpoint, if I don't look at it from the religion standpoint, if I don't look at it from the argument of who's right, who's wrong, Muhammad, Jesus, if I don't look at it from there, I would simply say their strategy of, conver their strategy of growing is kicking Christian's tail. So then Christians can either sit there and complain about it or they can do something about it. But Christians don't want to have that many kids. Christians are not having four, five, six kids. He has five. You said you have five sons? You, five five sons? Okay, he's got five sons. <laughs> I don't know how many of you have five sons at this table. I got two and two girls. <laughs> five sons is going to be the rest of us, right, if he's going to keep having these kids. <laughs> so what is your solution Shall as a Christian? And I'm purely talking business right now. The business of religion sure. is what I'm talking right now. According to the business of religion, they're going to win. And there's nothing Christians can do about it by the business. You can sit and argue the faith all you want. They're getting their people and their kids baptized because their job isn't recruiting Christians to become Muslims. They've only converted 20,000. That's not a lot. It's not a big number. But they're getting more kids, and they're raising their kids with the loyalty to the parents, and they're following that faith, and they're growing bigger, and we're not doing that. What, is your, what are your thoughts to that? Well, if you're asking me what the solution is, obviously Christians have to recover a sense of their faith and a sense of what's at stake. Because what you're talking about will happen if this continues is that the United States will look like Egypt or Saudi Arabia or Iran. Those were not always 
the heart of the Islamic world. Those were conquered and Islamized. And the Christians were, like Rashid was saying, were put, made second class, made subject to all kinds of humiliating and discriminatory regulations, and had to pay a special tax that's specified in the Quran, chapter 9, verse 29. And they ultimately, most of them in those areas, and in North Africa, other areas like that, they... Uh, Many of them thought, you know, why am I suffering this and having to live in this way? All I have to do is convert to Islam and I can live a decent life. And most of them did. And so you have areas that were 99% Christian and now they're 99% Muslim. And so people don't realize, they think, they look at Egypt and they say, well, that's the Islamic world. They don't realize that these things are always in flux and that exactly what happened there is beginning to happen in the West. And so I think that if Christians were to come to realize what's at stake, which would be extraordinarily difficult given the amount of propaganda and falsehood that spread about these issues in the mainstream, then they might begin to realize that they need to take What's the solution, steps. though? What's the, what's the next steps? What is the solution well, from they, your standpoint? They have to have larger families, certainly, and have to uh, meet the, the, the dawa, the proselytizing initiatives, and be able to answer all the objections to show the, the inhumane aspects but of But Christians Islam. are not that united. These guys uh, are right. united. Exactly. Uh, so Christians are competing against each other. Muslims are more united. You, yeah. Oh, not no, gonna... no. I, I disagree to Fine. that. We have Shia, we have Sunni. They are fighting each other. I agree. Killing each Fair other. enough, yes. And, and so they are not really united. And if you go to Salafis, they will make the Sufis are, as mushriks. But would you agree that Sunnis and Shias are united at least in the values? No. Not no. necessarily because, you know, the cousin or, you know, that's the history part where who got the past time. I'm talking purely values and philosophies. You know what? Muslims will claim we are 1.7 and when you ask them details they will be Ahmadis are not Muslims Shia are not Muslims and you will find just the guy in his mosque at the end <laughs> uh, instead of 1.7. I live that. When you really scrutinize yeah. them you will find just the guy in his mosque. They are the ones actually Muhammad said his, his people will divide to 73 uh, groups. And one of them only go to heaven. So 72 of them, they're just like kuffar. They are not really Muslims. So let, let's go back to that. Uh, a replacement rate, for example, in some countries like Iran is below. It's below 2.1. Mm -hmm. In Turkey, it's below 2.1. Mm -hmm. In others, they are below that. So there is, there is a huge drop. For example, in Morocco, I think it was like 6.9. And now it's like 2.8 or 2.7. So next generation will be below replacement rate. So they will suffer also from... from uh, you believe that? So I, you believe I, their I, numbers is going to go below the Christian yeah, replacement? Uh, I will believe they will drop because we have so, so many challenges, economy, so many other things. And another thing, they don't count how many people are leaving Islam. We don't have statistics. I have statistics, for example, people who write to me, according just to my show, from Morocco, from Algeria, from Iran, for example. So many people are leaving to atheism, to mm -hmm. Christianity, mm -hmm. to other, to other worldviews in Egypt, in Saudi Arabia. So they don't count that. I still count it as a Muslim in the 1.7. Yep. And many uh, people like me. So if they give freedom and we do real surveys, we will have the number less. Another thing, what Islam is left? The West forced Muslims to abolish slavery, to not practice the real Islam, like imputing hands and feet and crucifying. They, they are now forcing them to have one wife. So Islam, the version of Islam in the Muslim world is not really what they are preaching. So what Muslims do we have? According to their standards, probably most of them are kafir. And, yeah. and not only that, it's because of the death penalty for apostasy that this is unreported. But also there was a survey, and people did answer the anonymous survey recently in Iran. Only 40% of the population identified as Muslim. Now that's extraordinary, and it shows how inhumane Sharia Islamic law who is. Who ran that poll? Who, what, who? I don't remember who ran it, right. but it's, it's easy to find. We can look it up Rob, here. can you look it up? 1979 oh, to now, Got it, we've right had there. Islamic law in Iran, and now... Only now 60% of Iranians have rejected Islam. That's because they've lived it since 1979 and they realize how much they don't like it. Yeah, yeah I just want to comment because they're talking a lot about the supposed disunity amongst uh, Muslims as if you don't have that in Christianity, right? Oh, I mean, yeah, you do. Y you do, right? So, uh, Rashid, I, I know that Robert here is uh, Eastern Orthodox. He, he used to be Catholic. Uh, what denomination or sect of Christianity do you belong to? 
Because we are converts in Morocco, we don't follow anything. We just follow. I'm saying, like, do you go to a specific church? I meant went to many Orthodox, Protestant. I don't care. Okay, so anyway, my my point is, you have the three main sects in Christianity: the Protestants, the Catholics, the Eastern Orthodox. Historically, they fought with each other over very, you know, what from the outside people would think. Well, why are they fighting over this? I mean, today the Orthodox and Catholics are fighting over uh, doctrine. Actions like the Filioque, whether or not the uh, Holy Spirit proceeds forth from the Father and the Son or the Father alone eternally. And, and they're completely divided on this and, you know, call each other heretics and all kinds of stuff. So, so to act as if, right, there's this division among Sunnis and Shia when, as I think Patrick rightly pointed out, we have much more in common in terms of our actual values. We differ in terms of certain historical doctrines, but that's another story. On the other hand, you have so many different sects within Christianity, so many different denominations, all of them disagree and consider the, each other to be heretics. So for you to make that accusation and critique of Islam, I just don't think is correct. Just, it opens bro, up bro, to the history of the Catholics versus Protestants exactly. in Europe. Over five they million killed, killed in the wake of the Protestant Reformation. So, I mean, that's a um, <clears throat> that applies to Christianity more than Islam. But uh, going back to Patrick's <laughs> point is that you want to grow your numbers and the grow the Christian population. I want to help Christians grow, because I think a world that has more Christians is better than a world that has more atheists. But how can you have more Christians when you don't really believe in the Bible? We have exactly. the seeds of the destruction of Christianity right in this podcast, because when you look at the way that Robert and Rashid describe the Bible, they describe it as a book of fables, and it can continue to evolve. I didn't say that. This is Robert going to, this is going to cause really. apostasy. This is going to cause a decrease in faith. Like, why should I take Christianity seriously when it just evolves and it changes over time? I can't connect my practices and my beliefs as a Christian today with the historical Jesus. So why am I going to maintain myself as a Christian? And then the, also the, the whole theology, which we haven't discussed exactly. at all today, like the monotheism is uh, 80 to 90% of the world believes in monotheism, in one God. And monotheism is a central, crucial, the most important part of Islam, the belief in one God without partners. He is not like anything. This is a very powerful belief that 80 to 90 percent of human beings profess in this day and age. And Islam represents that in its theology and emphasizes that in its theology. But if you have a trinity or you have a theology that is not really clear, is Jesus God? Is there a Godhead? Is there this other system? Do we go by the Catholics or do we go by the Orthodox? Do we go by the Protestants? You don't have a consistent theology. Sunnis and Shias, they all agree on the on monotheism, God is one, he is not like anything. They agree on the Quran. Yeah, there can be some theological differences and nuances between different schools, but there's not the same kind of uh, disparity or variance between Christian sects and this idea of the Trinity, which frankly, no one can understand. Like, what does it mean to be three in one? <laughs> Let me, respond to that. Let, 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 let me respond to that. Let me respond to that. My brother is mentioning divisions between Catholics and Protestants. If I go back, there are divisions among the, the followers, the disciples of Muhammad, the Sahaba themselves, they killed each other. You know that the wife of Muhammad went and killed the followers of Ali in Mawqa'at al-Jamal. Thousands died among the first disciples. This, this didn't happen between Peter and John, by the way. And so if you you go to Islam from the beginning, they, they fought each other and they had divisions from the beginning. You know that, for example, the fight over the Quran was created or eternal. They fought over that. And actually, one time they had the whole caliphate going one way, the other time the prison, they killed people who believed that. So you're trying just to give a fake picture. There are divisions, there are killings among Muslims all through history from the beginning, from the start. 
start, which didn't happen within Christianity, by Paul the way. And Peter and uh, James. Oh, they didn't network? kill each other. They didn't kill each other. Because yeah, they didn't uh, have political uh, authority. Uh, okay. <laughs> oh, wow. Were they fighting okay. each other? Who, yes killed, no? who killed Ottoman, for example? Who killed Paul and who Peter and James? Were they at war? Were they fighting? Did were they, were they, they, they were not fighting. Okay. They weren't. Fight is Zolkis. to take an army against yeah. another one. Aisha took an army and have, killed people. If you don't have an army, I, okay, you don't have political a, power. You, you have, this you completely destroys you, the you, point. You, you lost your argument. You are trying to make, make a false analogy here. You lost yes. your argument. This is not also, an analogy. You're not going to. You're, you're not going to win it, over it, any Christians by the making constructing these though. straw man arguments that completely misrepresent. But, but, and, and, what and I would say this. But if I may, but if I may, and I want to hear your your thought. Just a quick rebuttal here. My point earlier is I don't think they're trying to convert Be, because because Christians? I think hear me out. Oh, sure they are. I, I'm sure they are. I'm sure they are. But I don't think that's where they rely on. The earlier point I made, their strategy on outgrowing Christians is to internally yeah. raise oh, sure. kids from the beginning rather than converting. Oh, yeah. That's the way they're going to be you know, able to do what they want to do. So if you want to yeah. respond, go right ahead. Well, they are, they are obviously converting Christians because Jake is here, but uh, the fact it's is 20, that Islam is not really that attractive a message, and so there aren't many people who are converts. Most of the people, like you're saying, the reason why it's growing is because of polygamy and because the uh, women have many, many more children than uh, women in the West do. But in any case, the uh, points that I was making are completely misrepresenting and running with your misunderstanding and claiming I said things I never said. The point that I was making was that the Old Testament and the New Testament, as I said before, are records of an evolving understanding among the people of God. And that because of that evolving understanding, they came to realize that these things had no applicability for all people for all time. The uh, idea that the Old Testament is not applicable for Christians is in the New Testament itself. That's actually a large preoccupation of the New Testament, that they are free. For, the Christians are free from the law. And so you bring up these Old Testament examples, you're, the, the big difficulty you have is that nobody in the Christian world is thinking this is marching orders for today, whereas people read the Quran, unfortunately, they do think that when it says kill them wherever you find them, when you meet the unbelievers, strike the neck and so on and so on, they do believe that these things are marching orders for today because the Quran does not have these different stages of development. But this doesn't mean in Christianity that just anything goes. In Catholicism and Orthodoxy, you have the apostolic succession and the authority of the bishops <laughs> who can authoritatively interpret the scriptures mm -hmm. and set the doctrines. And yeah. those doctrines have been consistent from the beginning. It's no, not as if it's some oh, free-for-all. No, Patrick, not, Patrick, excuse me, you're interrupting but, but, once again, your, and I your, never your interrupted you. Interrupting no, you. I'm, I'm friend, asking a permission. Uh, just a second. Okay. <laughs> Where And in, in, in Protestantism, you also have the uh, 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 fidel, at least ostensibly a fidelity to the Scripture so that you can't just say anything goes and we're going to become LGBTQ now, legitimately. Now, there are people who are doing this, and they are mostly in the Protestant purview because they don't have this authority that establishes various understandings of whether homosexuality is sinful or not, and so on, and so they can reinterpret these things, and that is a big problem. Nobody is interested in hiding any problems, but when you set up these straw man arguments and say, oh, Spencer said the Bible's fables and anything goes, you're just lying. I never okay. said that. Okay. Oh, you did? Uh, Actually, I, no, have, I, didn't. I have a comment about statistics. <laughs> Uh, Pew Research Center say Islam gains about as many converts as it loses in the U.S. So zero at the end. So even the 20,000, you can just cancel them. Another thing, um, Elias Bayounis, he said that 75% of new Muslim converts, they leave Islam after that. So the, m not many, 75% is a huge number. They go back because they find, usually they are fascinated with Middle Eastern, uh, non-white uh, religion. And uh, yeah, it's fascinating. Our brother is wearing even the Moroccan jalaba. He likes you it. Like it right? Yeah, oh, uh, it's our, it's not Muslim. Them, by the way, it's Berber. <laughs> <laughs> so you just think, because they're fascinated with these things and they think that's Islam, when they start digging in, oh, I didn't agree to 
killing apostates? I didn't know that Muhammad ordered that. Well, uh, Andrew, uh, every, Tate, every, every, Andrew Tate specifically uh, okay, decided uh, okay. that Muslims Just, stand for their principles. That's uh, why he converted, right? Uh, yeah, Andrew Tate. Uh, uh, I'm glad he converted to Islam, so take him. Uh, just I want to say something <laughs> about uh, Muslims converting to Islam. Then you find out little by little things that you don't didn't agree at the beginning. Every product comes with a warranty, except Islam doesn't come with a warranty. If you don't like it, your head is going to go. So that's why it's not an appealing <laughs> religion, and 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 people start rejecting it after after defining these little details inside. I, I want to give them an opportunity to respond, and then we can go to the next issue. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to respond because Robert brought up apostolic succession and claims that these doctrines have been held, you know, since the beginning of uh, Jesus. Jesus proclaimed his message to the apostles, and they passed it on to early church fathers, and and then it, all the way down the line, and it's been this consistent message throughout. But on very core doctrines, which Daniel and I would actually like to spend more time on, on what he called the 95%, which is actually monotheism. Unfortunately, we believe that Christians, Trinitarian Christians, are representing a veiled form of polytheism. And you claim that this was the consistent message over time. Well, let's see what Justin Martyr, your own saint, says. He's in the beginning of the second century. He was born in the year 100. In his famous dialogue with Trifo, chapter 56, he says this. Let's see if his theology is the same as yours, Robert. I shall attempt to persuade you, since you have understood the scriptures of the truth of what I say, that there is, and that there is said to be another God and Lord subject to the maker of all things, who is also called an angel because he announces to men whatsoever the maker of all things above whom there is no other God wishes to announce them. So Justin Martyr says that Jesus is a second God, is another God, separate and distinct, and he is a lesser divinity. Now John Baer, who I'm sure you would know is a famous uh, Eastern Orthodox authority today, he comments on this passage and he says this, as it is not God himself who thus appeared and spoke with man, the word of God who did all of these things for Justin, quote, another God and Lord besides the maker of all, who is also called his angel as he brings messages from the maker of all, above whom there is no other God. Then he says about this passage, the divinity of Jesus Christ, another God, is no longer that of the father himself, but subordinate to it a lesser divinity. Now, that's just one example, Justin Martyr, who you would consider a saint, you may even pray to, as <laughs> the Eastern Orthodox pray to de dead saints, but the reality is that your theology, according to you, on the Trinity, is actually more correct than the person that you're praying to. And I can go through a whole more list of on key doctrines, like the doctrine of the Incarnation, the Atonement, and the Trinity itself, that the early church authorities, like Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Tertullian, and on and on up until the 4th century never preached the doctrine of the Trinity, sir. So when you make the claim that your message has been consistent without, what we see in the very beginnings on the fundamental point of who God is, you did not have the same doctrine. It took to get to the 4th century, and that's why Christianity, because at its very beginning, was very comfortable with development. Oh, who is God? Is a man God? Is he God and man at the same time? So if you can have those sorts of developments, of course you can have developments about how laws are applied and whether or not we should be celebrating LGBTQ and all of that. That's your history, sir. Not at all. Actually, no. Uh, the difference is that when it comes to LGBTQ, it's very clear that homosexuality is immoral and that this is the consistent teaching of all the Christian groups up until quite recently. And so the ones that have changed that have departed from the faith. And you cannot have a development that contradicts what went before. The developments happen harmoniously. At the beginning of the church, there was a great deal of difficulty in understanding exactly how it was that God had become man. And so you have people trying to formulate it. And Justin Martyr tries to formulate it, and he does so erroneously. You have some assumption, probably coming from Islam, that the saints are infallible, and actually that's not the case. 
And so uh, you want to quote me fathers of the church from before Nicaea all you want. The fact is that the Trinity was formulated at the Council of Nicaea in 325, and there isn't anything that was taught by the authorities in the church. Justin Martyr was a great saint, but he was not one who was uh, uh, formulating the doctrine and in charged with the responsibility to give us what the teaching of the Christian faith is. The Ecumenical Council had that authority, and they formulated it in this way. Now, does this mean that Justin Martyr is a heretic? No, because he comes before that. This was is he a, wrong? A, a no, because yeah, he was wrong. Yeah, absolutely. So when he said he's but, another god, he was wrong. There's not. There's only one God. Right. We are actually monotheists. I know that the that Islam teaches that all the everybody else is a polytheist. I think you are. Well, we're not. (laughs) And so, (laughs) Justin Martyr was wrong about that. I'd be happy to speak. And that just doesn't pose a problem for Christianity. It does because, (laughs) as you said, the doctrine of the Trinity doesn't come until the fourth century. So why? No, there were people teaching it from the beginning. Justin Martyr wasn't. Robert, I let you talk. You're interrupting me now. Listen, (laughs) as I said, you just said that the doctrine of the Trinity came about and was established at the doc, at the Council of Nicaea in the 4th century in the year 325. We can talk about it another time because we would actually like to talk about theology. We want to talk about that 95%. So maybe we can do that another time. But the point is, and I challenge you, and I will be happy to debate this another time, that in the first 300 years of the church, you do not have a single church father, whether it be Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, if you want to go to Tertullian, although some people think he's just a church writer, down through the line up until the fourth century, they did not teach the doctrine of the Trinity, and I will defend that position anytime, anyplace. Okay, because sure, there were plenty of church fathers Give me one. who taught the Trinity, Ignatius of Antioch. There were plenty <laughs> of church fathers who taught the Trinity before Nicaea. It didn't spring out of nowhere. Basil the Great writes about it quite extensively, and so it's you acting like it was... Basil the, was when? Some people made was it up. Was Basil? <clears throat> well, he comes after the after the. Death Definition, but I'm saying that so, so he explains. So what's right, the point? so you We're think that he's, he's he's and he's one of the great saints, and he's revered as also one who form is is explaining and formulating like the doctrine. Into the yeah, story. exactly. Then, I'd like to transition to the next story. Yeah, we're we getting in the weeds time. here. We are, but that's this is what a lot I didn't want to do. That's why I said we went through that part at the beginning. We have a few different things to go through. So, Dylan Mulvaney, okay. Transgender, Bud Light, he comes out, he's going viral, he costs Bud Light, you know, Anheuser-Busch, I don't know, $29, $30 billion. It's a lot of money he costs him, right? If Dylan Mulvaney today has a change of heart, okay, goes to sleep, cannot sleep all night, is praying, boom, he wants to find God. Would the religion of Christianity or Muslim welcome Dylan to convert to become a Muslim or a Christian? Would Muslim welcome Dylan Mulvaney? Yeah, if he accepts that uh, he cannot be other than his biological sex, um, you know, that would be acceptable. Like when you can, when you become Muslim, it just requires saying the testification of faith. There is no God but God. There is no God but Allah. And Muhammad is his final messenger. Then you become Muslim and that wipes away everything that you've done previously. You start with a completely clean slate. So everyone is welcome to become Muslim and we invite everyone. So even a Dylan Mulvaney could be a Muslim. Yeah. On your end, Dylan Mulvaney lived a different kind of a life, wants to become a Christian, change his life. What position does the Christian faith take? Welcome. Yeah, anybody can repent and, and, and become a Christian. Actually, Christianity is for sinners, people who admit their sins and want to follow <clears throat> Jesus so he can um, live a better life and um, has his life changed and that's what happened to me and happens to millions. Well, in case he's watching, you have two choices now, Dylan. Which direction you want to go, okay? But I, I wanted to clarify that for him. I agree with Daniel. Yeah. He, he needs to admit he's a guy. Go, uh, great. That, that, and I'm sure if he's going to go through that, he'll do it. Next question for you. Enemy. Who is the enemy of Christians and who is the enemy of Muslims? Who is the enemy of Christian faith? Well, the classic answer is by uh, St. Paul that we're not fighting against earthly powers, but against spiritual powers. And ultimately, there's a spiritual aspect to everything that, 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 that an individual experiences in his life. Most of the time, they're not aware of it. But there are evil forces that try to lead people to do evil acts. Yeah, the, the enemy uh, is anyone who threatens um, freedom our freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, 
and um, anyone who is trying to kill the ones who are um, different than his religion or his thinking or his way of thinking. So um, any worldview that will threaten my freedom, my uh, way of life, my way of changing, choose uh, today to be a Christian tomorrow, a Jew tomorrow, an atheist, uh, anything that will threaten that my choices and will force me just to follow one way, I will consider it an enemy. Yeah, so um, that's an interesting answer. It seems like his religion is secularism and not <laughs> the Christianity. But when it comes to Islam, the biggest enemies defined in the religion is number one, Satan, um, because he tempts people and takes them off of the straight path. Um, then what's called dunya, which is like the worldly life, which is a delusion, the life to come, the afterlife. That is the true reality. Dunya. Dunya, exactly. <laughs> so we have to be focused on God and worshiping Him and being on the straight path. And then also our desires like lust that will cause us to commit sins. And then also our ego, which is called nefs. The ego, which tells us that we're greater than God, that we are more important and that we are better than others just because we are who we are. These are the four spiritual enemies of humankind. And then in terms of a worldly perspective, I would say liberal secularism is the biggest enemy to all traditional people, Muslim, Christian, and it is the world power today. Uh, fair, did you have anything to say or are you good? No, with I mean, I just be reiterating what Dan said. Sounds good. So, so here's, here's a question I got for you. Obviously, in America... Everybody here lives somewhere in America, right? We all live in America. Yeah. And there's a reason why we're here. We'd like to stay here, God willing, make our life work, make things work, and make it a place where we can raise our kids, have a family. Actually, I don't want to. but that's, You you want to no. move out of here. Yeah. So you're looking Soon at other possible. places. Really? Yeah. yeah. Have you thought about some places? Morocco. Oh, so you want to go where he is from? Yes. <laughs> oh, okay, Fent, any reason for it? What's your reasoning? My wife is from Morocco, and I've been there many times. I've spent a lot of time there, and I enjoy it, and I want to... Uh, I haven't had any children yet, and I am actually afraid about the American society and the way it's going, especially over the past 10 years, and I don't want to raise my children here. And by the way, to be fair, a lot of parents are also concerned about what's going on in America today. So good for you for actually wanting to go there. So here's, here's one part that's uh, confusing to me. Um, about three quarters of people, of Muslims, voted for Hillary Clinton when she ran for office. About three quarters. This is not too long ago they voted for it. That's Muslims, right? Today, 74% of Muslims vote Democratic. Okay, when I look at values and principles, I'll give you top 10 issues for the 2024 ticket for Democrats and Republicans. And I kind of want to get your thoughts here. Because this is an area where I feel like, you know, uh, 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 Muslims and Christians can actually be unified in certain areas. And if we do... It's going to be a formidable opponent to go up against. I'm sure they're not going to like this. So 10 most important issues for Democrats in 2024. Number one, climate change and environmental policy. Number two, health care. Three, Black Lives Matter, you know, police reform, things like that. Four, economic inequality. Five, voting rights. Six, education, then gun control, foreign policy, national security, labor rights, and jobs. Okay? The left is more pro-LGBTQ. That being taught in schools, you know, it's things that they're open to the idea. What's wrong with that? Let them learn at an early age, et cetera, et cetera. On the right, Republicans, economic policy and taxation, number one. Number two, conservative judiciary. Okay, so Supreme Court, having conservatives being conservative, you know, Supreme Court being conservative. Mm -hmm. Immigration, border security, four Second Amendment rights, national security and defense, social and cultural issues like abortion, religious freedom, Opposition to certain aspects of the culture war, worlds, wars, etc. Race, the, you know, critical race theory, LGBTQ, some of the focal points. Seven, election integrity. Eight, state rights and federalism. Nine, energy and environmental policy. And ten, being healthcare. So Dems, healthcare number two. Republicans, ten. You know, when I when I talk to a lot of Muslims, they the values and the way they raise their kids and their families. I don't see any of it that would match much of what the left is presenting. Why do so many Muslims vote Democratic? Well, it happened after Bush. It happened after Bush basically uh, pushed through this Patriot Act, which criminalized so many Muslims just for their beliefs. 
Um, so many imams were deported, so many imams in America, like American imams, uh, just based on technicality. So many imams were uh, put under investigation, put on watch lists, no fly list, which was expanded uh, under Obama, actually. And so that kind of attack on the Muslim community by the Republicans uh, really traumatized a lot of the Muslim community. And I, for many years, have been telling Muslims that, look, we shouldn't just reflexively align with the progressive left because their tolerance and their acceptance of Muslims is only skin deep. When you actually look at the policies and the foreign policy of the uh, Democrats, like Hillary of all people, <laughs> like Obama, they also have some very anti-Muslim policies, both domestically and internationally. And uh, we have to look beyond the niceties, like Joe Biden will come on and say, you know, inshallah, or Ramadan Mubarak, and maybe a Republican won't do that. So just because he gives you that nicety, you're going to like bow to that political party. That makes no sense. Um, we should not align with one particular party. We should maintain our independence and others should cater to the Muslim community as a voting bloc, um, <laughs> as opposed to us giving our allegiance to one side reflexively in the way that has been done uh, in the past 10, 15 years. Got it. What would you say, Jake? No, I'll just reiterate the same thing so Kai. we can give them a chance. Robert, what are your thoughts on this one here? Because to me, you know, I look at the history and I have the conversations and I'm always, you know, surprised on what value from the left. I know there's a part of it's like, well, the right is more pro-Israel than the left is. Sometimes the right is too much defensive of that and the left is a little bit more open to the idea. But what would you say? Well, Israel does have something to do with it. And it is also a lot, actually, what Daniel said, some of it was actually true, that uh, the uh, policies of the Bush administration and some of the things that still linger were uh, so incredibly wrongheaded. And Muslims were quite resentful, in some cases, with immense justification. Uh, at the same time, also, the, uh, and I think this is the heart of the matter, the left is sold out to the idea of racism and is obsessed with the idea of racism. Islamic groups in the United States, particularly after 9-11, but before that also, like the Council on American Islamic Relations, Muslim Public Affairs Council, and others, they very skillfully have portrayed any criticism of Islam, even opposition to jihad violence and Sharia oppression of women and others as racism and bigotry. And, you know, Daniel actually has said in some of his debates that the uh, you, you criticize the left's agenda and you get put on hate lists and deplatformed. Well, that's actually happened to me because I spoke the truth about Islam and the left does not want that out. They are completely sold out to the idea that is the Islam that Muslims are all of one race and that they're non-white and that consequently any opposition to Islam is just racism and white supremacy and that consequently they have to stifle all criticism of Islam and all opposition to jihad and defame and destroy those who speak that criticism. And so the, the, the Islamic groups love that because Sharia actually criminalizes criticism of Islam and it carries the death penalty. But, but your, so work they racist, work into, your work is racist. That's a lot of hooey. Your, your site calls for investigation of me, like his site. He for is you? called to investigate me. Yeah. Well, yeah, you do, do you read your you own do site? call for the death penalty four, for apostasy and so on. He has four articles on his site dedicated just to me <clears> that <throat> I need to be investigated because I don't agree with LGBT. May I respond? On his site, the thing about Robert Spencer, and I'm glad that he brought up this issue of racism, he is a racist. Like his site, anytime a Muslim anywhere or any Middle Easterner doesn't have to be a jihadi or doesn't have to be a Muslim even, commits a crime, he puts it on his site and says, oh, jihadi, Islamic terror. And he creates this fear mongering against immigrants. And imagine if you had a site dedicated to whenever a Jewish person committed a crime, you say, oh, Judaic violence 
violence and you called your site Jew Watch or anytime a black person committed a crime, say, oh, Black Watch, this is black terror, this is black crime. That's what he does to Muslims and he's had a long career <clears throat> of this. He was involved in the same counter-terrorism uh, work with the Republicans that he's now decrying and saying, oh yeah, I disagree with that. You are a part of that effort. You are a part of those administrations. Daniel, you're lying. Them. You're lying again. I did. It, it, I did advise the FBI when I was invited. I advised the FBI uh, and military groups, CIA, a couple times. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. And that was mid-level people who invited me, who were trying to change the point of view of the higher ups, and that's why I got in. Yeah, to, I, to, that, to, uh, to that's not like me as terrorists. And I wrote. I have the no, CIA. No, you're and lying. These three-letter agencies Daniel, on me because of the kinds of work. That, you're, Kind of you're defaming me, and you're lying, and I need to have Am a, I not a chance on your to site? respond. Yeah, you're, there are four articles there. How many articles are at Jihad Watch? About 80,000, going back 20 yeah, years. Muslims there like are me. four that mention you, and three of them I didn't write. So I'm not entirely versed on everything you they take say. mainstream but Muslim if, speakers if like me and you says, depict them as terrorists, you are not as mainstream. hate mongers who need to be investigated. You are a That's hate monger, and you approve. Did you not approve yeah. of the Taliban? I approve of many Muslim governments. Do you so, approve uh, of the Taliban? Yes or no? You always do that. I do, do approve of the, is, uh, okay, the Islamic good. Emirates okay. of Afghanistan. Okay, great. Yes, I do. So I What's, track jihad. Do you approve See, of excuse Putin? me. Do you excuse approve me. of the Russian Orthodox Church invading Ukraine? No. Ex no, you don't? So no. you denounce the Russian Orthodox? Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, your, your own church, great. The you hierarchy. Just, That's not my church. It's par for You're not orthodox. orthodox. I am orthodox. You okay, have so no, you, uh, you see, you have no understanding of yeah, Christianity. You, you've denounced the Bible. You, I am Greek orthodox. Jesus. Okay, no, I guess it's you're fine. lying again. You set up these straw men. But the point is that he's no. racist. He's been cited by terrorists. No. Anders Breivik, who okay. killed oh, about 100 he, people he, in Norway, he cited on. Robert Spencer. He said, read everything from Robert Spencer about Islam. Am I going to have he gets a endorsed from tourists. He keeps multiplying these things. And so you have to uh, allow for some time. Would now, you accept with a site called Jew Watch? Answer that. It's not an analogy. If my sites were Muslim Watch, then yeah, you would have a point. But it's not. It's Jihad Watch. And Jihad is people killing innocent people, terrorist activities, flying the planes into the buildings on 9-11. And so no, no, I no, track I Jihad activity. Muslims didn't fly and, any excuse planes me, into you are Excuse me, you are interrupting again. And you were trying to make sure that I can't answer this defamation because you know that it's lies and you want to make sure the truth doesn't get out. But the fact is that the uh, site tracks jihad activity. And it is a lie that if a M Middle Eastern or a Muslim person commits a crime, I put that on the site. I only put it on the site if there is justification for the behavior in Islamic texts and teachings. You think and that Islam is, advocates for random killing of people? That's false. There you, you are think plenty of Islamic authorities that I yeah, can give so you there are plenty who justify of that verses kind of in the thing. Bible that justify and there that are kind of thing. So anytime of a Jew, anytime a Jew excuse commits me, a crime, you are interrupting yet again. You put there it on a site plenty, and call it Jew -wise. Excuse me. <laughs> there are plenty of Muslims who will justify Muslim clerics who justify the behavior, and I give oh, the terrorists. quotes. People that have Jihad been condemned. Excuse no, me. We can give them. And to as far as Brevik goes, I knew this was going to come up at some point. It is a total lie. It was a total lie from the beginning, and I was ready for it. So so I actually have what Brevik actually said. The Muslims showed us that deadly shock attacks are the only tool we have at the moment, which will guarantee that our voice is heard. That's on page 1351 of his insane Read what manifesto. he says about you. Yeah. <laughs> Read what he says me, about you. He quotes me, and he quotes a lot of other people. He says, now, I recommend everything me, Robert me. Spencer has you, written on Islam. Did he realize, say that or not? Did yes, he say he that did or not? Say that. Okay. Now, do you realize exactly. what you're saying here, what you're getting yourself into here? No, no, because I just want to make me. That, he, you have excuse the same, me. You keep you talking over me because you, you do not want the truth to You ask me a question. You ask me a question. Brevik You have the said, same ideology as Brevik. Said, you have the same anti-immigrant ideology me. as Brevik. Brevik actually criticized me because I would not call for violence. Can you unpack and for so the audience if, what's, what, yeah, what Brevik, you guys are talking Brevik about? Brevik is this crazy man in Norway who killed 77 people at a youth camp. They were not Muslims, as incidentally. They were just kids. He was a nut. He's a, he's a, he was a lunatic. And he wrote this 1,300-page manifesto, right right. which is very suspect. Because, for example, one of the reasons why I mentioned many times in it is because in it is the entirety of the script of a documentary I was in in 2002. And 
I asked the producer of the documentary, how did this lunatic get the transcript of the documentary? And he said, I don't know. Not only was it never published, but it was never even made. We never made a transcript. And this guy who speaks broken English in half of his manifesto is suddenly perfectly transcribing an over 100-page documentary in which I mentioned multiple times and speak multiple times. It's very suspect. And we don't know if it was the, who, who was behind it, it was who was with him. I'm suggesting his manifesto was, yeah. You don't think he Obviously, wrote it. the killing was real, but I think he might have written part of it, but he certainly had help. He didn't write Now, the anyway, the thing is, is that he said that the Muslims inspired him to do violence. He says that very clearly. I just gave you the quote. If being quoted by a bad person makes one evil, then the Quran no, that's is quoted my, all the time. My the Quran you're strawmanning my position. The Quran is quoted all the time by terrorists. Can so I if I am we guilty because Brevik, left. if I am guilty because Brevik quoted me, then the Quran is guilty because terrorists Rock, quoted Robert, all the time. I'm going to give Daniel a chance to respond, and then we have 17 minutes left. I haven't even finished left. responding to everything else he said. Yeah. Before. yeah, yeah so, did you have a follow up on what yeah, you wanted yeah. to so say? So the thing is, my point wasn't that oh he just cited Robert and that makes Robert bad. That wasn't my point. My point. Was was that Robert shares the same ideology as that terrorist. The terrorists had the view that immigrants are a problem, especially specifically Muslim immigrants. They cause a problem for Western society. We need to stop immigration. This is a white supremacist, white replacement type of ideology, which Robert either shares or he, he basically facilitates with his site, which takes any time a Middle Eastern person commits a crime. And the best example, he claims that, oh, we check whether the person has a Muslim background and has some kind of Muslim ideology. This is false. Just recently in June, he uh, there was a Syrian who stabbed children in France. And Robert immediately posted, up oh, another Muslim jihadi attack on his Twitter. His site put up an article. Then it turns out that this guy is a Syrian who's a Christian. His name is Abdul Masih, which means uh, slave of the Messiah. He's a Christian. And all of the major news reports, uh, <coughs> BBC, France 24, reported that this was a Christian, actually. Robert doubled down and he said, no, 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 this is a Muslim. And his site continues to have an article up that says this Christian is actually a Muslim who stabbed children in a playground. This shows that it's a racist. This is a racist ideology that he's promoting because it's not based on ideology. He just sees a, a Middle Eastern name and says this is Islamic terror. And that's just one recent example. Like many examples of this recently, like the, uh, there was a stabbing in Brooklyn. I would like Brooklyn. to spend two more minutes on this. Okay. Because well, I, then I have to have a chance to you respond. Have a, you have a go forward and respond, and okay. we're going to move on to as the next As far topic. as the guy in June goes, he said he was stabbing babies, and he says, praise be to Jesus Christ. Now, this is a, obviously, he's somebody who's trying to imitate whether he's a Muslim who is pretending to be a Christian. ISIS has called for Muslims to pretend to be Christians in the West and carry out terror attacks. So that's a possibility. Also, there were people who knew him who stepped forward, and there were stories about it in the French press that said he was actually a Muslim. So I reported on these things. And I reported when he said he was a Christian, it's all there. It was a developing story, and there were several articles that we had about it. But the idea that there was some deception, much less racism, that's just Daniel trying to demonize so somebody who actually agrees. I agree with Daniel about Islam. Let, that's what that's I'd like to do. That's the funny thing about it. I'd like that's to, why you call for I my believe, investigation. <laughs> I didn't. I'd like to go to the next phase. But There's, I think you should be, yeah. There you go. I'd like to go to the next phase. What do Christians and Muslims have in common? What do they have in common? Well, they would have disagreed, but monotheism is certainly one thing. Definitely not. And uh, there is in Islam the uh, appropriation of the uh, biblical prophets such that it's kind of invasion of the body snatchers Christianity. I mentioned the movie before. They take your personality and give you a different one. And so you have Abraham, you have Moses, you have Jesus in the Quran, but they're completely different figures from what they are in the Bible. Robert, what do Christians, Muslims, and Jews have in common in America? What values and pr uh, principles do Muslims, Christians, and Jews have in common in America? Yeah, there's a general, probably in some aspects of sexual morality, with the exception of polygamy and sex slavery of infidel women and some other things like that, wife beating. But otherwise, you have the idea of the value of marriage. That's something certainly that they have in common. What would you say? What do Christian Jews and Muslims have in common? Values and principles in America. 
Yeah, we have <clears throat> we have shared values with actual traditional Christians. When it comes to reform Christians, they're basically like Reza Aslan, Christian re versions of Reza Aslan. Can you even call them Christians? With traditional Christians that actually care about the Bible and just don't don't call it a book of fables, we have values in marriage, you know, preserving marriage, pre preserving chastity, modesty, uh, you know, opposing sexual immorality, preserving gender. You know, the concept of gender is so important. That's a shared value with traditional Christians and traditional Muslims. The importance of the family, respecting parents, respecting, you know, raising children the right way raising children to respect these values of morality, communities coming together. These are all shared values. They're traditional values. Do, do you think... Belief in God. Belief in God and, and caring about God. Do you think society or, or you know, again, uh, uh, rip this apart as much as you want. Brother Rashid, you can... You know, what I'm about to say here right now, you can come in and fully disagree with what I'm saying. Do you think uh, there is a... Uh, uh, you know how we always talk about who are the people of power, like the real people of power. I'm not talking about like, you know, millionaires and billionaires or presidents. I'm talking people that are really the people right. of power, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think they would like to keep uh, Christians, Muslims, and Jews, uh, specifically Christians and Muslims, divided, pinned against each other with the fears of them potentially being united or no? That's a religious division that there will never be a element of a unification amongst Christians and uh, uh, Muslims against a common enemy? I mean, as somebody who studied Islam, Islam puts Christians and Jews as the first enemies from the first uh, from it started, Muhammad. A closer to the mic. Muhammad's Muhammad's uh, enemies. They were Jews and Christians. He never mentioned Buddhists or Hindus or any other religion. He mentioned basically Christians and Jews. So that the Muslims inherited that that um, enmity from Muhammad until today. If you ask them who is the enemy, they will be the West. If you go to Morocco, for example, do a st a statistics, it will be the West, especially America and Israel, because they represent Christians and Jews. So when, when, when the Quran says, do not take Jews and Christians as friends, do you think what happened to Jews and Christians through history was just random or was based on doctrine. When the Quran says like you have to fight the, the, the Christians and Jews until they submit and they give the jizya, do you think that enmity started back then in the seventh century or it just somebody caused it today? The enmity is inherited in the text in the, uh, Omar bin al-Khattab. He kicked the Jews and Christians from the Arabic Peninsula. And Muhammad said, I, uh, uh, I, uh, I will kick out Christians and Jews until only Muslims are kept in the Arabic Peninsula. When he was dying in his deathbed, he said, Cursed be on Jews and Christians because they took their, the graves of their prophets as, as, uh, as shrines. So all these things are embedded in Islam. Actually, my book... Uh, the, the, the ideology behind Islamic terrorism, the first chapter is in the beginning, it was hatred. So the beginning, the root of terrorism is hating who are not Muslims, especially Jews and Christians. There is a huge hatred. Actually, in the Sunnah, hating the non-Muslims is a must, is a part of faith. They have a doctrine called the wala wal bara. You have to take only believers as your your close friends and close allies, and you have to hate disbelievers. So this is inherited. If somebody want to follow Islam by the letter, he should take uh, Christians and Jews as enemies. Look, I'll, I'll answer your actually answer your question. Uh, the powers that be, do they want to divide Christians and Muslims? Yes, absolutely. The powers that be started this war on terror. And they started this attack on all religion and tradition. They started with Muslims, and they created this counter-extremism policy. If you have certain beliefs as a Muslim, you believe that we should follow the Quran as it was revealed, follow the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, then you are an extremist, and we have the right to surveil you and detain you, etc. Now they've moved that from Muslims 
to Christians. Now Christians are coming fire under fire. All the tactics that were used against Muslims are now being used against Christians. Christians are being uh, watched by the FBI. You go to protests like Drag Queen Story Hour at the public library or at the school board, you're on a watch list by the FBI. Uh, so these were tactics that are used by Muslims. Now they're being used against traditional uh, Christians. And Robert Spencer was a part of that whole apparatus. So yes, the powers that be do want to divide Muslims and Christians because that way they can have an easier time. Most people are attracted to traditional religion. Most people hate feminism. Most people hate LGBT. Most people hate these new isms, these ideologies, yeah. and they want to stick to their traditions and values. How do, do the powers that be want to conquer those religions and values? Divide and conquer. So that definitely, I'm on the same page with you on that. Yeah, I, I only ask the question because, you know, when, when, when I started our own insurance company, this is the thing I can use, is because we attracted people from all walks of life. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter who it was, black, Hispanics, Asians, Christians, Scientologists, atheists, Catholics, Hispanics, Catholics. And we figured out the way to find things that we had in common. We have disagreements. No, I disagree. No, no, no. I, you know, I just had a very nice, friendly debate with one of our top guys who's a Muslim. And we had a religious debate. We had a political debate. But then we found a bunch of things we agree with, mm -hmm. right? What, what they valued, what we value. Right. I don't think, um, you know, eventually when, and I know I'm going to use this analogy because we talked about the mob earlier and you were talking about what happens when you leave the mob and you're talking about what happens when you leave the Muslim faith. Eventually in New York, the five mob families came together and, and they unified together, right? And I'm not using that analogy to say the similar things here, but I wonder what would happen if we realized that what they're trying to do to our kids, none of us agree with, you know, none of us agree with, you know, the whole saying goes that somebody can curse you uh, out and you're like, yeah, whatever. Hey, you're Robert, you're such a effing this. Oh, okay, cool. Hey, you know, you're such a effing this. You don't All right, cool. Hey, let me tell you, you know, you're a loser. Cool. All right. Hey, I'm going to turn your kids into teaching them about LGBTQ at five years old. I'm sorry? What did you say? I'm going to do that. In Armenia, it's like you go after the mother. No, no, we're not doing that. You go after Prophet Muhammad. Hey, what are you talking about? What are you doing? This is not, this is not okay with us. I think, you know, that's happening today. And I don't know if it's there right now. But I would be very uh, uh, interested in finding ways to get more and more of these communities together to talk. <clears throat> We're going to have differences. We're going to have philosophical differences when it comes down to religion and theology and this mm -hmm. and that, of course. And by the way, I'm not sitting here saying I agree with some of the values and principles that your church offers or your faith offers. I can't live like that. But I respect the fact that you respect it and you, you're you know, devoted to it. It, it doesn't mean it's something I want to do, you know, but at the same time, you're talking family, you're talking kids, you're talking certain things that we could agree on, traditional values that you're talking about. I can get behind that. Somebody may watch this and they're Muslim, they're looking at Robert, and Robert's obviously the biggest antagonist on this show today because <laughs> naturally you've written the most things that's upset the most from the Muslim side, so you're going to be a target. And you've taken a like a, you know, you've been a good sport about it. You know, you've sat here and you've heard and you've given your position. Jake's come at you very prepared. I think Jake uh, has done a phenomenal job with his arguments that he's had. Daniel's been very uh, respectful. Uh, Brother Rashid, you have been, from your standpoint, extremely passionate about what you've done. And uh, to be quite frank, your testimony is probably the most powerful one out of all of ours at this table. Thank you. Because you've gone through it. You went through it. You've seen the pain. And at the, at, at, at the end, though, the audience, I hope, gets to see again that we can sit down, have a conversation, be respectful. Everybody made their points. There was no limitations on what one could, one could say. And I think the real bigger enemy is not going to like us uh, finding ways to unify. I just don't think they are. And the role I'm playing here is an element of my own curiosity and long-term finding ways to you know, fastest way to eliminate an enemy is to 
uh, turn him into an ally. I'm trying to find ways if we can have some kind of a relationship and unify folks from different sides and see where this can go. So having said that, we are at the end of the podcast, at the end of the discussion that we had. Appreciate everybody's uh, sportsmanship and being respectful to, uh, you know, to one another. For the most part, you, everybody was respectful. Rob, let's make sure we put the links below to everyone's book so everybody knows. As well as, if you do have a YouTube channel, if you'd like to promote it so people know to come and find you as well, you, you do have one. If you don't mind yeah. sharing yours, everybody, if you can do that, and then we'll wrap it up. Go yeah, my YouTube channel is uh, The Muslim Metaphysician. So if you just type that in on YouTube or any social media platform, Twitter and whatever else, you should be able to find it there. Uh, I mostly discuss theology uh, with Christians and atheists. So that's what I focus on, and you can find it there. Daniel? Yeah, I have the Muslim Skeptic channel and also muslimskeptic.com where we really debate a lot of these issues that are brought up. We didn't get a chance to get into detail on some of these issues like minor marriage, quote unquote, wife beating, etc. So I really analyze these topics. And I explain them in, in, a, in a way that audiences can understand and, and really appreciate the Muslim perspective, the Islamic perspective. Um, so yeah, and I appreciate you, Patrick, for doing this and having this kind of conversation. I think it's really valuable and I appreciate you for that. Yeah, Anytime. I just, Anytime. I'd like to add that too, because I didn't get a chance to say that. I think oh. that you've been very fair and, and we appreciate that. Also, one more sh plug that I can make, sorry, uh, for Muhammad hijab because uh, Muhammad hijab you talked to him and Eddie and they facilitated this so yeah. I really hope that you have Muhammad hijab on uh, here because he's really a Muslim amazing Muslim public intellectual and he'd be you know you have a great conversation inshallah I, I would love to have a, a very influential uh, gentleman like Muhammad hijab a uh, one from the Jewish community and one from the Christian community mm -hmm. for all of us to have a conversation together. I realize two hours is not enough, two and a half hours is not enough. I think right. that may be three, four <laughs> hours, but we'll figure something out. R I know you have a channel. I know you're all over the place as well. Yeah, I actually uh, am a little bit uh, lagging in terms of the videos. I have a YouTube channel, Jihad Watch Video, and every Wednesday evening, whenever we can do it, David Wood and I do a show this week in Jihad, covering the latest news, uh, but uh, unfortunately, I don't have a whole lot else there. I've been focusing on writing books, uh, have the Critical Quran, and uh, book The uh, Empire of God, How the Byzantines Saved Civilization, A History of the Roman Empire in the Byzantine Period that's coming in November. I'm also writing a new biography of Muhammad, Muhammad, a critical biography, evaluating the history historical value of the various texts. I'm about halfway done with that. That'll be out next year. Fantastic. Thank you, Brother Rashid. Yeah, I have a website called uh, BrotherRashid.com and also a YouTube channel called uh, Brother Rashid TV. And uh, also I uh, have Twitter account. You can find me, Brother Rashid. Facebook page. I have two, 2 million followers on Facebook page, so you can find me there. And also uh, my book is on Amazon if you want to buy it. Uh, the ideology behind Islamic terrorism, it's there. What a weird uh, podcast this is. Been. I mean, if you think about but it, thank you so much, Patrick, yeah. for doing yes, this. Thank you very Anytime, much. Anytime, guys. Thank you again for being respectful and being a sport about it. This was fantastic. Hopefully in the future we'll do many more of these again. Gang, for those of you that watched it, I hope you appreciated this, converse, uh, this conversation uh, as much as I did. Have a wonderful weekend, and we'll do this again next week. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye, bye-bye. Bye-bye.